seven. Yeah, that is extremely, extremely interesting. I, I'm I'm not sure if it if there is some sort of underlying strategy. I'm not sure if she's kind of uh, tossed in the cards at this point. But uh, Lesson Lewis is very much one of the strongest, if not the only strong social conservatives. Um, I believe, and, and don't quote me on this, but I believe she's actually fundraised quite a bit more than Jean Charest, despite, I believe, trailing in the polls most recently. Um, so she has a very significant supporter base among those uh, among those conservatives out there who are, who are principally c- concerned with social conservatism. I I think that there might be merit, and perhaps there is something, uh, which I mean was also somewhat promised under Erin O'Toole and we never saw, but given her strong representation for those socially conservative voices and her popularity out West, um, someone like Pierre Polyevre suggesting that she would have a very prominent role in his government is likely to be strategically advantageous. Uh, it remains to be seen if perhaps with both of them stepping out, we're going to be hearing something. I have no inside information. I'm just sort of spitballing as to why these two folks will not be there. Um, As far as the three other uh, people that are still participating tonight, the debate tonight will be in French and English. Once it goes live, we are going to jump to that. Um, So you you will be able to catch all that content. You will not miss out on that. Um, We are going to be sort of here interacting on on the fly and getting your sort of live feedback on that. But we do also have William Diaz and in the spirit of a French debate, Beltium, on location. Um, And so he's going to be asking some of those tough questions, participating in the scrum and kind of uh, sort of pushing the envelope um, as far as forcing some of these candidates to engage. Now, I I must say, whatever you think of uh, Jean Charest, Roman Babber, and uh, to an extent, uh, Mr. Aitchison, they, they've not necessarily really shied away. Roman Roman Babber has, has been extensively available for interviews. He doesn't say no to certain questions. And frankly, Jean Charest, in the very sort of same vein, he is an experienced politician, obviously. They have not shied away from those sort of tough, tough uh, conversations. They, they've been happy to meet us there. Jean Charest, in fact, joked recently that I think I saw him at three events in a row, and he's like, you're everywhere I turn. So we're there asking those sort of tough, tough, tough questions that people want answers to. Again, leadershipreports.ca, the place to go to see all that. I think we've cornered and had conversations with every single one of these people. So the plan is to have that conversation. Now, I'm just waiting to hear, uh, William, we are hoping to bring him in uh, for a a live hit from the location to give us sort of a vibe um, before that first kind of dud uh, conservative leadership debate in Edmonton. Very much the vibe when we spoke to people was this is a completely renewed and revamped conservative movement. They haven't seen excitement like this for a long time. I'd say back to Harper, but I'd suggest that the crowds showing up for Pierre Polyevre events or something else entirely. Um, do you feel that, I, I think William will be joining us in just a moment here, and we'll, so we'll throw to uh, a video in just a second here. Oh, he might be coming in now, actually. Do we? I think we'll uh, we'll do like a couple of ads, and after that, yeah, let's let's we'll jump to an ad William. as we work on the tech to get him on board here. So let's jump to an ad, get that sorted out, and uh, we'll we'll be live with Will in just a sec here. Hey, folks, check out the newest arrival to the Rebel News Store. Yes, F is for Fidel, and F is for Father. I mean, could it be? Yes, it half this photo, the colored half is Justin Trudeau, the black and white half, is a young Fidel Castro. Wait now, or is it vice versa? It's so confusing. I'm a huge Forensic Files fan. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a piece of Justin's DNA and a piece of Fidel's DNA and put the rumor to bed once and for all? But in the meantime, we'll just have to walk around wearing this shirt, hinting at a great Canadian conspiracy. Or is it? In any event, if you want to get this shirt, folks, go to the Rebel News Store and check this out. Type in our new discount code, that's SUMMER, S-U-M-M-E-R, and if you buy two unisex t-shirts, you get an additional one for free. What a deal. Like I said, Justin Trudeau, Fidel Castro, as they used to say on the ABC detergent ads, can you tell the difference? I can't tell the difference. My mug? I know. 
It's pretty cool. So is this hoodie I got on, and you could have it on too if you check out our special website at rebelnewsstore.com. That's where you can see Freedom Focus hoodies that we have for you, beanies, cell phone cases, you name it, all while supporting our journalism where we fight to bring you the other side of the story as opposed to, you know, being forced by the Trudeau government to fund leftist media out of your taxes. The truth is... Without you and your generosity, there is no Rebel News. So again, if you like the reports that we bring you and that we also fight for freedoms in Canada, please consider doing some shopping, picking up some swag at rebelnewsstore.com. We appreciate your support. happening to the world. Everything is changing. The very idea of human being some sort of natural concept is really going to change. Our bodies will be so high tech we won't be able to really distinguish between what's natural and what's artificial. Inside our own heads is the most complex arrangement of matter in the known universe. You might ask yourself, can we get to be superhumans? Adam Sos here for Rebel News. You know, our company is growing quickly and we'd actually like for your company to grow too. That's why this ad space that I'm speaking through right now is actually available for you to purchase. So instead of people listening to me, they could actually be learning about your company, learning about your business. If this interests you, if this is an opportunity you'd like to capitalize on, send us an email at ads at rebelnews.com. Hey folks, check out the newest arrival to the Rebel News Store. Yes, F is for Fidel and F is for father? I mean, could it be? Yes, it, half this photo, the colored half, is Justin Trudeau. The black and white half is a young Fidel Castro. Wait now, or is it vice versa? It's so confusing. I'm a huge Forensic Files fan. Wouldn't it be great if we could have piece of Justin's DNA and a piece of Fidel's DNA and put the rumor to bed once and for all. But in the meantime, we'll just have to walk around wearing this shirt, hinting at a great Canadian conspiracy. Or is it? In any event, if you want to get this shirt, folks, go to the Rebel News Store and check this out. Type in our new discount code that summer. S-U-M-M-E-R, and if you buy two unisex t-shirts, you get an additional one for free. What a deal. Like I said, Justin Trudeau, Fidel Castro, as they used to say on the ABC detergent ads, can you tell the difference? I can't tell the difference. My mug? I know. It's pretty cool. So is this hoodie I got on, and you could have it on too if you check out our special website at rebelnewsstore.com. That's where you can see Freedom Focus hoodies that we have for you, beanies, cell phone cases, you name it, all while supporting our journalism where we fight to bring you the other side of the story as opposed to, you know, being forced by the Trudeau government to fund leftist media out of your taxes. The truth is, 
Without you and your generosity, there is no Rebel News. So again, if you like the reports that we bring you and that we also fight for freedoms in Canada, please consider doing some shopping, picking up some swag at rebelnewsstore.com. We appreciate your support. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. How about Everything, you? Everything's great on the ground. You know, right before we went to that impromptu ad break, and I do apologize uh, for folks just sort of getting everyone connected, sometimes doing these live hits from the ground, there's little hiccups, but very happy to have you on. Uh, before we jump to that impromptu and extended ad break, we were just talking about how before the first leadership debate, there was sort of this sense of energy and excitement, uh, especially with Pierre Polyev drawing these massive crowds. That first debate killed the energy a little bit. I think the moderation wasn't great, but but from what you're seeing there on the ground, um, when you're when you're talking to people, what's the sort of vibe on the ground from people with regards to this leadership race? Well, honestly, right here, there's not that many people. There's no crowds here in Ottawa. We have the media on one side. We have the the politicians on the other on the other room. Uh, so we're going to be monitoring the debate from a second room right here. We're not able to ask questions during the debate. However, afterwards, there's going to be a scrum here where I myself and other CBC CTV journalists are going to be asking questions to uh, the politicians when they're going to be coming out in the room. So definitely stay tuned for that. But until now, I'm just here alone in the studio about 30 minutes away from downtown Ottawa, which is a little bit special, but we'll see what happens. So just to confirm, are, are there some people in the room with the politicians watching, or is it just being live streamed? Uh, to be honest with you, I have absolutely no clue. The only room that I personally have access to right now, along with other journalists, is the media room. Uh, where I'm going to be going in about five minutes right after I'm finishing this little chat with you. Uh, so I can't really see what's happening in the positive room. As I said, it's a really strange, special debate this time around. It's not the yeah. same as other debates that we did have in the past. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have to stay tuned and see, see what happens later today. Alexa, any questions? Um, I would say um, you are, you will be there. You will be uh, covering the, the scrum at the end. Um, so you bilingual. So everybody, you have the three uh, people in Rebel that are fluent in both language, French and English. Uh, William is bilingual, and Adam so too. Um, so I would say, if you have the chance to do like with Jean Charest, uh, a follow up a question with a follow-up oh, i would say use use both language because mr charrette doesn't really um answer the same way when he's french because since like a lot of people in quebec can see the answer in french most of the time it will uh, not answer the same way so i will say if you're you capable Ask the first question in English and follow up with a French uh, question. And that would be interesting to just see how he react to see like that he's been questioned in both language. That's uh, really uh, a, a good way to, to start. And um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, so now you are right there. Uh, it's not as the same other debate. Uh, you, we, you cannot see any crowd. So it's mostly just media. Do you think it's really yeah. made for media? It's just like really just a mediatic uh, um, debate. It's probably why uh, maybe Pierre Poliev and Leslie Lewis didn't want it to be fully there because it's just me media there. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting. It's definitely a different format. Plus, when we have three of the five candidates that are here, as you just pointed out, uh, Pierre Polyev will not be showing up and Leslie Lewis announced uh, early uh, in the last few days that she will not be showing up as well. So today it's three only, Roland Baber, Jean Charest, and Todd uh, Hsin. It's definitely not the same vibe as this first debate that occurred uh, earlier earlier this year. But yeah, during the French part of the debate, I'll make sure to live stream as well on Twitter. And I'll try my best to translate, the tweet, uh, to translate uh, what the politicians are saying for our viewers that are English-speaking first. So they can also understand the French part of the debate, but it's definitely, definitely going to be an interesting uh, format at the same time. 
I, I wanted to jump in quick just to let folks know if the debate does kick in. Often these things start a few minutes late. They'll whisper in my ear. We'll jump straight to that. So don't worry, you won't miss anything. Alexa, though, I think you tapped into something really sort of pivotal there, and we've seen it at past events. When these politicians are in Alberta, it's all let's build pipelines and oil's great. It's a very sort of different rhetoric. Um, Maxime Bernier, the leader of the PPC, very often says the difference between us and them is whether I'm in Quebec or in Alberta, I'm saying the same thing. Thing. Are you? Do you think that this new uh, conservative party is the leaders are going to be acting like Aaron O'Toole? What they say changes province to province, or do you think that there's some sort of principle or backbone starting to shine through? But I know that for Share um, is really for Quebecer. Like it, it was, like it was our premier for a while, so he wants to gain more popularity for Quebec because. When we're, we're there, he lose a lot of his popularity. So um, what we saw so far in the media in Quebec, where it was in French and in English, it, it, it was not kind of the same kind of vision of man. Um, I think he have a lot of work to do for the French side, but I'm, I would be curious to see like all the other candidates would do, um, will perform in French because as we know, uh, the, be the best performance was come from Pierre Poliev and Charest. And we will see like more maybe words to do on the Aitchinson and uh, Barber. So we'll see uh, what we're going on. But I'm really interested to see like what will come out from the French debate this time that we don't have like Pierre Poliev and Charest that is actually fighting almost with each other. Yeah, what, what, what's your reaction on the ground to that? Obviously, a uh, bilingual speaker, you've probably seen a bit of French and English answers. Yeah, no, they're definitely the, the two candidates, Touch, is Scott Aitchison and Roman Baber, are definitely not the best people to, to, for, for the French debate. So it's, I don't expect the same kind of reaction, the same kind of in-depth answer from those two politicians that we would normally get from someone like Pierre Poliev or Jean Charest, who are able to be fluent in, in French. We all know that Jean Charest, his first language is, uh, is French. So the only thing that I expect from those two politicians is less in-depth answers uh, here today. And I'll have a listen. The debate is supposed to start in one minute, a minute and a half, so I'll have to get going, go back to the media yeah. room that's fine from the, from the Of positive. course. We'll, we'll let you go. Priority is having you on the ground. Looking forward, everyone go to Rebel News or leadershipreports.ca. Uh, William's full report will probably uh, be up tomorrow, if not a couple days after that. Uh, looking forward to those important questions that Rebel News and other, a few sort of independent media outlets are the only ones willing to ask go work, uh, do some incredible work on the ground. Um, we may have to cut to one little quick ad here as we retransition our studio back to just the two of us, and we will be going live to the debates in no time flat. But thanks so much for taking a little bit of time to join us. Thanks, uh, William. Thank you, and um, thanks, uh, thanks to be there on the ground. Thanks for reporting uh, what is going on and uh, ask a really, really important question. Uh, everybody, we will be back after this ad. So I absolutely love having the opportunity to chat with you, to chat with our ever-growing audience. But I'd actually love for you to have that opportunity as well. We actually have advertising opportunities available with rebelnews.com. We don't get handouts from the government. We trust on supporters, viewers, and advertisers like you. So instead of folks listening to me in this spot, they could actually be checking out your company, getting information about your business. For more information or to advertise with us, send an email to ads at rebelnews.com. Really great to have our intrepid young journalist on the ground there. Also great to have this bilingual team. I know sometimes, particularly here in Alberta, 
you'll ask someone their opinion on something and they'll say only in French. It's great to be able to engage with them and have that conversation. Um, I did think uh, we're just waiting for the debates to start. So once again, we will jump to them live as soon as they become available. But I think you really touched on something, not necessarily just in as far as capacity to speak the language proficiently, but the actual ideological shift in responses when politicians and Aaron O'Toole like flip-flopped on energy and things very overtly, um, assuming what there was no one in Alberta who could translate. Well, lo and behold, there's a few of us. Um, but there, there's this sort of like, oh, well, I can say something completely different over here. No one's going to clue in to the fact that I'm being phony. Um, do you think, I mean, I, I think from what I've heard, Pierre Polyevre largely says the same things. I think Jean Charest actually largely says the same things. Um, he emphasizes building pipelines a bit more, but he does say the same things in Quebec as he does in Alberta. Uh, what about these other candidates? Have you, er, do you think that they're, they're actually saying what they believe? Or do you think that we're going to be seeing flip-flopping on key issues like Alberta energy pipelines, these things? I think I think we will see uh, probably the same line of thinking, but as you know, um, <laughs> Quebec have like different kind of thinking than the rest of Canada. Sometimes, especially like when we saw uh, Mr. François Legault to actually ban the extraction of our like hydro hydrocarbon um, fuel, so he really don't want that we extract our own natural resources, and and when we saw some some uh, of what Charest say that he wants to to take the uh, natural resources from Quebec. Okay, what how are you gonna do that when our premier have banned that from our province? So my my concern is like, okay, you can promise so many things, but how are you gonna do that? You are gonna change our premier idea to say, oh, you gonna you cannot ban anymore our our extraction because I took the decision that we would do it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm just getting a word in my ear that they're starting right now. So we'll, we'll catch up afterwards. We'll react a little bit live throughout. They're doing introductions now, but uh, we'll be able to see if they are going to sort of hold their ground. We've heard many of their responses. We'll see if uh, the folks who are here are going to be consistent. We'll hop to the introductions right now. The president of the Conservative Party of Canada. C'est maintenant le temps de vous présenter notre modérateur pour ce soir, Rob Batherson. It's now time for us to introduce tonight's moderator, Rob Batherson, president of the Conservative Party of Canada. He is a conservative volunteer involved in the party for over 30 years. He's a representative for Nova Scotia on the party council, has been since 2016. He was elected president by his colleagues in 2021. He's also a member of the election organizing committee for this uh, leadership election. Let's welcome Rob Batherson. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Rick. Good evening, Conservatives and Canadians, wherever you're watching this debate from coast to coast to coast. On behalf of the leadership election organizing committee, I'd like to thank the thousands and thousands and thousands of grassroots Conservatives who asked for this debate. And thanks to the generous donors who contributed more than $25,000 to make this an event that pays for itself. We're the Conservatives. We live within our means. It's a wonderful opportunity, and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to moderate tonight's debate. Our 90-minute program will be split according to Canada's two official languages. The first 45 minutes will be in English. La deuxième partie de 45 minutes sera en français. The second part, 45 minutes, will be in French. consists of four themes for a total of eight questions. The first two questions in each section will be straight question and answer for each of the three candidates, with the next two questions providing an opportunity for open discussion at the conclusion of the Q&A. At the conclusion of the English section, we will provide two minutes to each of the candidates to cover off anything they'd like to add at the midway point of the debate. And once we have finished the four questions en français, we will provide an opportunity to each of the leadership candidates to make their closing pitch to members in the official language of their choice. The leadership candidates were informed of the themes in advance, but have not seen the specific questions in advance except for the opening question. A draw by the leadership debate committee involving representatives of participating candidates took place last Thursday to determine the speaking order. 
I'd like to welcome our candidates participating in tonight's debate, Roman Baber, Baber, Scott Aitchison, and Jean Charest. Let's kick things off with our first question, which in many ways is your opening pitch for tonight. All of you have spent the last several months crisscrossing Canada, listening to and speaking with Canadians. What have you learned from Canadians? What's the mood of the country? And based on what you have heard from Canadians, what makes you the best candidate to be the next leader of our party? Again, each candidate will have three minutes to answer this question. We'll start with Scott Aitchison, three minutes. Great, thanks Rob, I appreciate it. Uh, the first thing I would say is that it's been an immense honor and a privilege to travel this country and meet Canadians from coast to coast. There's a lot more that unites us than the partisan bickering that goes on in Ottawa might suggest. But the single biggest thing that I hear Format Canadians tell me weird. everywhere Individual in this country is that they're actually looking for a government that simply des delivers results. They're tired of the photo ops, they're tired of this, the, the talk, but no real action on a wide range of issues. So how do we conservatives show that we're ready to lead? We have to show them a real plan, a real principled conservative plan. At my core, I'm a small town mayor, and I've had to work hard all my career from municipal council up to mayor up to today to earn the trust of the people I serve. My campaign for the leadership of the Conservative Party has been about ideas, offering real solutions to the problems that Canadians face every day. And I believe we need to focus on three priorities, making life more affordable, keeping Canada strong and free, and also defending Canadian values. You know, to make life more affordable, we must start by ending the housing crisis. And that's why I talk about implementing my YIMBY plan to get more homes built. We need to lower grocery bills. We need to end supply management. And in the process, we will also get government out of the way and help our farmers sell their products around the world. I'll also end the carbon tax. You know, only a liberal plan would take your money, hire a bureaucracy to manage it, mail some of it back to you, then ask you to thank them for it. You know, that's not fighting climate change. That's a shell game trying to cover up a tax scheme, another liberal tax and spend program. And speaking of taxes, they should be simple, predictable, fair, and lower. And so that's my plan to fix Canada's broken tax code to simplify it. And we need to keep Canada strong and free. We must once again be reliable partners on the world stage. That means investing in our armed forces and meeting our 2% NATO target. It means supporting countries like Taiwan and Israel who face threats to their democracy every single day. And at home, we need to stop attacking legal gun owners and instead focus on, the, on stopping the flow of illegal firearms heading into our country. You know, we have to be frank. To, def to, to, to get this election done, to win the next election, to replace Justin Trudeau, we cannot do it unless we're united as a party. And so no matter what happens on September the 10th, we conservatives need to come together and offer Canadians a principled conservative message that will retire Justin Trudeau and get this country turned around. You can read more about it in my website at votescott.ca. I want to thank you for tuning in and sharing a few moments with you. I'm looking forward to answering more questions. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Mr. Real, Aitchison. We'll really now go to there, it's John just, It's very minutes. reminiscent, thank you very aside much, from Robin. the fact and that he I talked about strong and free. Um, it's very reminiscent of, of uh, Aaron O'Toole. There's a lot of similar energy animals. plants. We'll get back to show right here. When this leadership yeah. race started, that uh, this is fundamental to our responsibility towards the members of the party to be accountable to them, to answer their questions, to participate in a, in a debate. For a candidate in a leadership race not to participate in the debate is like a fish who says he doesn't want to swim in the ocean. I mean, this is the basic thing that we all need to do and, and should be accountable for. And I, I, I want to commend Instead both Roman Instead of really and like for being doing his speech, Scott, it's actually like pushing the head of and the two other that parties. is not there. Because at the end of the day, if we are not united as a party, it's pretty simple. We're not going to be getting the confidence of Canadians. Rob, you talked about the mood of the country. And the mood of the country isn't very good. Our country is more divided today than it has been uh, since I've been involved. You in just did it! And it isn't you just, just like east-west, it's intergenerational, did a right it's now. urban and rural Canadians, it's uh, also between new Canadians and uh, who, who now live in a period where they just feel that the federal government is not doing their job. In fact, I've never seen it so bad. 
the government of Mr. Trudeau can't run a passport office, the airports are a mess, the immigration department is a mess. I mean, there's nothing that's getting done. And yet we pay taxes for all of this and you'd think that they would have their act together. And there's an urgency to change governments. Canadians want change. And they're looking to us as conservatives as the alternative. And that's what this race is about, to offer an alternative. I've done exactly that with policies on defense, policies on environment and, and resources, policies on daycare, policies that speak to the fundamental issues that our families are facing in this country, affordability, housing, all these things that count for every one of us. But conservatives, if there's one thing I want to say to conservatives that I've heard from every one of you is that you have had enough of losing. We lost in 15, 19, 21. And it isn't so much that we lose, that we lose the campaign, well, the, that the Liberals win. We give it away to them. We have to be the most generous party in the world. Well, if we've had enough of losing, if there's one thing that is now clear in the race at the moment that I am speaking to you now, is that I can win a majority government. And that's what we need. None of the good ideas that Scott has, Roman has, that I will propose in this leadership race, will actually mean anything unless we gain the confidence of Canadians in urban areas, in Ontario, in Quebec, in Alberta, and that we work out of the base that we have in Western Canada. In this race, there is one choice. If we want to form government, I ask you to support my leadership. Thank That's you. what this candidate campaign is all about. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Charest. Uh, we don't have any sad trombones in this debate, so I'll ask uh, all of you to <laughs> indulge me as I keep the uh, order going. Although I did uh, do some trombone in junior high. No, no sad trombones here. And we'll turn the floor now over to uh, Mr. Babber. You have three minutes. Thank you, Rob. Rob, I'm a friendly guy, and over the last few months, I've spoken to thousands of Canadians. Canadians tell me that they're tired of the incompetence of this Liberal government. I practiced law for 12 years before I was elected and I helped build a small business. So I'm going to bring my private sector skills to create a culture of professionalism and accountability in the federal government. Many Canadians tell me that they're giving up on Canada and then they want to go on their own. I'll extend a hand of friendship to every Canadian in every province to heal our divisions. It doesn't matter who you are or where you live, you'll have a friend and someone who will listen to you in the federal government. And I promise you, many Canadians are telling me that they're not feeling well. That's probably the most important issue that's facing us today. A mental health catastrophe is gripping our nation. Most of us have COVID and 85% of us are vaccinated. We need to end, and I will end this public health exercise. And going forward, let Canadians make their own choices together with their doctors. We need relief and we need to move on so we can all heal. I hear from many Canadians how hurt they are by 21st century segregation, how personal choice and basic security of a person were violated. Many Canadians lost their jobs, denied mobility, access to loved ones in a hospital. I was the only conservative fighting this evil before it was cool. I brought a bill in Ontario to stand up for jobs a year ago. I will ban this discrimination and freeze funding to any province that still allows it. People are people. I learned that in law school when I worked at a community legal aid clinic, you have to respect people's choices and people's dignity. Canadians are scared of censorship and government. We're censored in the media, online, by regulators, at work. I lived the first nine years of my life under a communist regime. My family feared the KGB and taught me not to talk about politics or disclose that we had a prayer book. I got the gift of freedom and I know how precious and fragile our democracy is. We're free, we're free Canadian, and we have the right to be wrong. Speech is the holy grail of all rights, because through speech we defend all other rights. I'll repeal all of the censorship bills, I'll defend professionals, there is no free speech without free and independent media, I'll free social media, defend the CBC, and end all subsidies and bailouts to the media. I will never silence Canadians, political opponents, or members of parliament. Finally, Canadians are losing trust in government, but not with me. I got kicked out of the Conservative Caucus in Ontario for opposing the lockdowns. I lost my Justice Committee Chair and my loved ones have been put through very hard times. But I fought like hell, every way I knew how, because that's what Canadians expect from us, for our democracy and for our children. I'm always going to say what I believe and do what I believe is right, even when it's unpopular. And that's a principle I'll return to the Conservative Party. Canadians are counting on us. I'd be very humbled to lead our party and our country.
Thank you, Mr. Baber. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll turn now to our next question. Each of you will get 90 seconds to respond. Last week, Pope Francis visited Alberta, Quebec, and Nunavut to apologize to Indigenous people for the horrors of residential schools. As our next Conservative Prime Minister, how will you succeed in restoring trust, respect, and economic opportunity with Indigenous peoples? We'll start with Jean Charest. You have one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. This is one of the sad legacies of Mr. Trudeau. He created an incredible expectations about reconciliation. But let's just dwell a moment on one example. He said he would fix the problem of portable, potable drinking water in First Nations Indigenous communities. And it isn't done. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, after all seven years, you think this can't be done? I guarantee you one thing, I'm Prime Minister of this country, it will be done. We will do what we have to do to fix this. It is inadmissible that Canada would accept this. And for indigenous, indigenous Canadians, what we need is to help them develop their leadership and their economic base for their communities. One of the things I want to do is a federal indigenous opportunities corporation. I'm stealing a book out of what Alberta did, so that we offer indigenous leaders and communities the opportunity to participate in their economic development, not just by receiving royalties or passing on their land, but actually owning equity in projects. That is the kind of change that will be consequential and real for indigenous Canadians. Same thing for housing. In this leadership race, housing is a big issue. Scott's just raised it. I think Indigenous Canadians should have a program run by them for Indigenous Canadians. That's the kind of real-time leadership that the country needs. Thank you, Mr. Shara. We'll move now to Roman Baber. One minute, 30 seconds. Thank you. I think we have to be honest and learn from our history so we don't repeat it. But dividing Canadians like Justin Trudeau does actually hurts reconciliation. The best thing we can do for reconciliation is to improve the lives of Indigenous peoples. We still have hundreds of communities in Canada that don't have clean water, and we've been talking about this for 20 years. We can make water out of air now. There are no more excuses. I'm going to get water done by the end of my first term. But there's no improving lives without safety and dignity. Many reserves are experiencing lawlessness and violence. We must protect Indigenous people and especially Indigenous women. We must stop pretending that this isn't happening. We must defend all Canadians, and that means instructing law enforcement to defend Canadians who live on reserves. And generally, let's stop being afraid and start rethinking life on the reserve. Imagine not owning your own property. Imagine being told by a chief that you no longer live in your home and that someone else is now going to occupy your home. I'm not going to pay lip service and I'm not going to play pretend. I'm going to work with a new generation of Indigenous leaders and Indigenous business leaders to improve the lives and safety of Indigenous Canadians. Home ownership improves communities and the quality of life. Let's get it done. Thank you, Mr. Baber. We'll now go to Scott Aitchison. Thanks. One minute, 30 seconds. Thanks, Rob. I, I, I would say that this has really been the most important theme of my campaign, it's one of respect. And this, I would say, is where our institutions have most failed um, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And you think about the question, relationship. It hasn't been a relationship for generations in this country. It's been a top-down, patriarchal kind of approach. Uh, and in some cases, early on, it was about you know, erasing Indigenous First Nations culture. And so I, I look at what's has, what has gone on, and, and Jean spoke a little bit about this. You know, in the last six years, the Liberals have completed 12 of the 94 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Report. 12. In 2020, they completed a grand total of zero. And in 2021, when hundreds of unmarked graves were discovered at residential schools, the Liberals completed three within the span of a, a month. So why did it take such a horrible discovery for the Liberals to take action? It's because they don't take action. They're about photo ops and talk and not action. And so as Conservative leader and as Prime Minister, I would start from a position of a real relationship, which is about respect. We know what First Nations people want and what they frankly deserve from what we learned in the Truth and Reconciliation Report. We need to make sure that that relationship is real and we improve the lives of First Nations people everywhere. And as Conservative Party leader, I will get it done. 
Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Thank you, candidates. For the next two questions, as a reminder, after our Q&A round for each question, we'll have a four-minute open discussion period. As moderator, I reserve the right to intervene as appropriate during the four minutes to ensure each candidate is given comparable time to speak. Now on to our question. It's harder than ever to travel across Canada. Inner city bus service has disappeared in many parts of the country. Passenger rail is so inadequate that Canada's environment minister was forced to abandon his cross-Canada climate change rail tour. Pearson Airport's a mess, and our major air carriers have reduced service in the peak summer season. As the next prime minister, how will you get Canadians moving again? And we'll start with Roman Baber, sir. You have one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. There's a very important issue regarding mobility of Canadians that I'd like to address first. It's unthinkable that we still force 15% of Canadians to detain themselves under threat of jail every time they enter and exit Canada. Mobility rights are not just charter rights, they're human rights. The passports do not prevent the spread of COVID and we need to end the shameful episode in our nation's history. And no new normal in mobility. Public Safety Minister Michael, uh, Marco Mendocino said that the federal government now sees a use for the ArriveCan app beyond the pandemic. This is exactly what many of us have feared. The tools that were created, that were developed to keep Canadians safe from COVID will remain post the pandemic and will form a new surveillance state. I will not allow Canada to turn into a surveillance state. A free and democratic society does not hinder entry and exit of its citizens. Next, I'm in favor of massive transit in the GTA. I represented a North Toronto riding and we should not be afraid to talk about issues that are important to folks in the GTA. It's good for the economy, it's good on our balance sheet, it's easy to finance and will spur economic growth, and it's good for housing. And the best thing we can do for housing is build more roads. Building roads encourages the construction of new and affordable communities. I'm gonna start building roads again in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Baber. We'll move now to Scott Aitchison. One minute, 30 seconds. The floor is yours, sir. Thanks, Rob. Well, I, th there's no question that we've all heard the horror stories at, you know, Pearson Airport where things are a disaster, where our airlines, uh, whether it's, you know, passport lines that people can't get a passport in this country because, again, the Liberals just can't get the job done, whether it's Nexus lines where, you know, Canadians, you know, pay huge fees for air travel and rail travel and it's not really a great service to begin with. But I, I, I think what matters even more than this issue, frankly, and, uh, and I, I like... I really think it's the most important issue that Canadians face today is, is social mobility and upward social mobility. And I'm pivoting back to, to the importance of housing because there are an awful lot of Canadians in this country who can't even dream of the idea of taking a flight somewhere because they don't have a warm bed to sleep in at night. And to me, that's the, that's the, that is the great crime that this government, this liberal government has promised billions and billions of dollars over the last seven years and the situation has gotten worse. The CMHC has told us the situation is actually worse. And so I've said many times, if promising billions of dollars could solve the problem, we'd have a housing surplus in this country, and we don't. And so while it's important to clean up the mess and actually get services working for Canadians so they can travel again and we can move around this country, the most important issue facing us, frankly, is making sure that every Canadian has a warm, safe bed to sleep in at night, and I will get that done. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Jean Charest, you now have one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. You know, transport is one of the key drivers of our economy. And it is about the simple idea of moving from one place to the other, but it's about productivity, it's about an economy that works, it's about the ability of Canadians to actually get to their place of work and get back home and do it efficiently. We live in a federal system of government. There is a role, and if, we, if we're going to get this job done, it requires that we have a Prime Minister who under, actually understands how this country of ours works. The provinces have their responsibilities and the municipalities have their responsibilities. As Prime Minister, one of the first things I would do is within the six months after being elected is convene a federal provincial meeting with the premiers, the Council of the Federation. This would be one of the items on the agenda. How do we actually sit down together, because we can't do it otherwise, to make sure that we have the kind of infrastructure we need to be able to move people around, whether it's buses or trains or it's ports or airports. On airports, it's sad. It's, all of us are traveling these days. I mean, it has become uh, you know, a nightmare. 
Who would have thought Mr. Trudeau wanted us to be one of the best countries in the world, that we'd rank among the best? Well, we actually rank among the highest in the world for the worst airports. Pearson Airport. And airports, Rob, is the entry point of any given country. Who would have thought we'd be a country that you can visit for a week and leave your luggage here for two weeks? <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's exactly what we want, Thank and I, I can guarantee you I'll do better. Thank you, Mr. Shadai. We'll move now to our four minutes of open discussion, and I'll invite Robin Babber to get us started. Mr. Babber. Thank you. Look, if we learned anything from the Rogers outage a couple of weeks ago is the terrible state of our federally regulated industries. We have a complete mess because we have three phone companies, two airlines, and five banks. There's absolutely no reason to continue to defend this antiquated regime or any of those antiquated institutions. No, we need more competition to get, their, to get them off their backs and working again. So I propose that we allow for more competition, and that includes competition in airlines. British Airways lands in Toronto on its way to Vancouver. There's no reason why I can't hop on it and, and pay less. So I propose to remove barriers to entry and encourage competition attract new players, no more protectionism. It'll be good for the economy, it'll be good for jobs, it'll be good for the consumer and good for prices. I'm going to free these federally regulated industries and get Canadians moving again. Mr. Atchison, your thoughts? Yeah, I, and I would completely agree with what Roman has said. We do need more competition. Uh, it's amazing to me in this country how much we have traded away for exceptional service, for some sort of nationalism around you know, our own airlines and and that kind of thing. But, you know, uh, the bigger issue for me for the airlines and for the airports, frankly, uh, is, that, is that in a lot of other countries, they see airports as economic development tools and drivers. Here in Canada, we see them as cash cows. So the Ministry of Transportation just charges them huge rents. Uh, and, and, and that's crippling to airports. And, and we should see them as, as massive economic development drivers, not just for tourism, but, 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 but for trade around the world. We're a trading nation. And, and these are... The, the, the major ports that we get goods in and out of this country. And so we, we should see them as economic development tools, not as cash cows. And, and frankly, we need to create a culture of accountability in these government agencies. That's the problem in Ottawa in general, is that there's, there's not a culture of accountability and results. And that's what a Conservative government led by me would deliver. Mr. Shutter. Something's terribly wrong in this country, uh, Rob. It's passports, airports, uh, Department of Immigration. The government's not working. It's not delivering services. By the way, when you go to the airport and you buy a ticket to travel somewhere, you actually pay fees. You, as a citizen, you pay for the services that you're supposed to get at the airport. This isn't, it doesn't happen for free. And you're not getting those services. So the, this, the next federal government has to get serious about this and give real direction to how airports should be administered with accountability with benchmarks on service that you receive. For example, on ArriveCan, ArriveCan we should do away with the first day that we form the government. There's enough bureaucracy at the airport. We don't need to layer it on. So these are things that we should do. I'm also a big believer, Rob, in, in, the, uh, in, in using the train service. I think one of the lost opportunities in this country for years has been our, an opportunity for us to develop a rail service across the country that's much more efficient of faster trains, we could actually connect to the United States, do things with them that would allow us to change the cities of Canada, change the way that we travel. But for that to happen, we need a, a federal government that has a vision and gets serious about this. Okay, Mr. Shadar, we got 40 seconds. Uh, Mr. Babber, or Mr. Aitchison, uh, either you want to dive in? I think a lot of this, I think a lot of what's happening right now at the airports, at the passport office, is a self-inflicted wound. We know that this government is so determined, it's so intent to pursue misguided COVID ideological response that is no longer based in science. It creates friction at our airports, at our passport offices, in our healthcare and, everything, and everywhere else. We need to end and go back to normal. It will immediately give us relief. Let's give Mr. Aitchison a few seconds there. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a classic situation. We have a liberal government that believes that the government should be and all, do and be all things to all people. It's simply not the case. Conservatives know that if you introduce competition, you can actually improve services. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Great discussion, candidates. We'll move now to our next question. Conservative Party members oppose a carbon tax, but Conservatives are also committed to action on climate change. Both statements are included in the party's policy declaration. And groups like Conservatives for Clean Growth are calling for a stable, credible, 
long-term net zero climate plan. My question is, can we have a net zero climate plan while maintaining the party's opposition to a carbon tax? Scott Aitchison, the floor is yours for the next one minute, 30 seconds. And the simple answer to that question, Rob, is yes, we can. You know, for seven years, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals have missed every single climate target they've set. And what's worse, they've just sought to divide Canadians by attacking our energy sector. We are a resource superpower, this country. And all they've done is attack our resources. Conservatives will do better. We can do better. My, my plan to fight climate change and protect the environment will actually get the job done. If I become Conservative leader and Prime Minister, here's what we'll do. We will have an infrastructure resilience plan to help Canadians deal and adapt with the extreme weather events. Climate change is here, and we need to invest before disaster strikes, not after. We will lower industrial emissions by making the biggest polluters pay. We will phase out coal and intensify, densify our cities and invest in technology, not taxes. We will focus on nuclear power, Carbon, carbon, carp, carbon capture technology will get the job done. Canadians need to see this as an opportunity. If Canada was wiped away from the face of the earth tomorrow, it would have a negligible impact on climate change and, and the carbon output on the planet. So we need to do our bit, but also make sure that we are selling this innovative and entrepreneurial technology to the world to help the rest of the world reduce their footprint as well. We have the tools, we have the skill set, we have the know how. Let's Let's sell it to the world. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. We'll turn now to Jean Charest, one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. One of the keys to us forming a national government is having a credible plan on the environment, resources, and climate. If we don't have that, we will not be elected, period. And uh, by the way, a slogan is not a climate plan. And you can't tax your way into reducing carbon emissions. That is not a plan either. I would do away with Mr. Trudeau's carbon tax on consumers because it hurts rural Canadians, it hurts small and medium-sized businesses. What I would do is a comprehensive approach, and it includes carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, whether blue or green, biofuels, small modular reactors. These are all the areas in which Canada can develop expertise. There's four provinces working together on small modular reactors that include Saskatchewan, Alberta, Ontario, and New Brunswick. We can lead the world in this, and if we do it, we'd actually assist the oil patch by allowing them to have a different source of energy than natural gas to be able to draw the bitumen and the oil that we should sell around the world as a reliable and ethical supplier. The world in Ukraine has reminded us that had we assumed our responsibilities, had we been wiser and had a prime minister who had some leadership that we would actually be able to go out there and supply energy to Europe instead of watching Europeans finance Russia to invade Ukraine. We can do this and have a levy on big Thank you, Mr. producers. That's the Thank approach you, Mr. that Canada needs. You'll have some time during the open discussion. Uh, we'll move now to Roman Babber, one minute, 30 seconds. I'm going to take a different approach, Rob. Uh, I was not afraid to take on, on the radical COVID mob, and I will not be afraid to take on the radical left-wing environmental mob. We should not, as conservatives, be afraid uh, about talking about the environment. We know that Canada produces less than 1.5% of all global emissions, and there is no certainty that even if you were to cut all of those emissions, that that would make a material difference in the climate. We know who the polluters are. They're in China. They're in Russia. They're in India. And the Paris Accord does not hold them anywhere near to the same standard as Canada is held to. So I'm going to reframe this conversation. Canada is blessed with so much forest that much of our greenhouse gases are actually naturally absorbed. And we don't get credit for that under the Paris Accord. And I do not believe that taxing Sally $10 at the gas pump every time she fills up her car is actually going to affect the global climate. I don't think that many people actually believe that anymore. And I think that many Canadians agree with me on this topic. So I will not impose a regressive tax that only serves to punish Canadians. However, I would like to look at planting more trees. Right now, we're planting about 360 million trees a year. I would look to increase that to half a billion a year. I love trees. I love Canadian forest. Let's try to capture most of our emissions naturally. 
Thank you, Mr. Barber. We'll open up our four minutes of uh, discussion and ask uh, Scott Aitchison to get us started. Mr. Thanks, Aitchison. Thanks, Rob. And I, uh, I, I guess I'd like to challenge my, uh, my colleagues a little bit here. We're very friendly. We all get along. But I think it's important to, to challenge. And I, and I appreciate where Roman comes from on this issue and what, what, what you said, Roman. But at the same time, you know, my comments about you know, marketing technologies to the rest of the world to help them reduce their footprint is important as well. And I, and I think it's important that, you know, why don't you acknowledge that, that we can see this as an opportunity for businesses and entrepreneurs in Canada. And I want to challenge Jean as well, because Jean, you talked about the importance of having a climate change plan and a policy that we, if we don't have that, we will not actually be elected as the next government. But unity is also really important as well within our party. And so I, I want to challenge you, Jean, because there's been a lot of talk about what happens after this. If, if I don't win or you don't win or you don't win, what happens? We have to come together as a party after this is over, whoever the leader is, and work together. Will you be part of that? Will you continue to work together as a conservative with the team, whoever the leader is, and help bring the party together? But Scott, would, do you disagree with me that this is a key issue for us being elected? Absolutely it is. It is? Okay. Well, then we agree on that. We agree. We need a credible plan. And by the way, conservatives should, uh, you know, take some credit for our history in dealing with these issues. Rob, we actually gave birth to the most credible, the most effective uh, environmental treaty in the world, the Montreal Protocol on reducing CFCs and HCFCs, which, by the way, contains economic instruments. We're the government that actually did the Clean Air Act with the United States to reduce SO2 emissions. That also includes uh, e economic mechanisms. So my proposal is taking a book out of the page of what Alberta does with a levy on large emitters, which are the most effective ones to be able to deal with this. And by the way, this is what the oil patch agrees with, so that we are able to reach zero emissions by 2050 and do it in a smart way. And we should uh, you know, look at what Europe's doing. After Glasgow, Europe has actually proposed a transitional period that includes natural gas and nuclear. Well, Canada needs to be smart about this, and we can be smart about it. And if you know, if you follow what's being done in Alberta, the positions taken in the energy industry, they actually agree with this approach. This is the smart approach that will get the job done, and you know what? We'll also gain the support of Canadians and elect a national conservative government. Thank you, Mr. Shaddai. Mr. Baber. Thank you, Rob. Look, Scott, of course I'm in favor of, of new and, and advanced technologies. I just want to make sure that the taxpayer is not held holding the bag. We've seen that happening in Ontario with the former Kathleen Wynne and previously the McGuinty government that would finance all sorts of green technologies. Uh, for instance, there were a lot of solar panels that were costing us about 70 cents a kilowatt of, of hydro, uh, but the market rate was about 7 cents. And so Ontarians were held uh, holding the difference and, and paying the difference, and that's what created this, this remarkable uh, green energy debt that Ontarians are now settled with. Second of all, what I'm against is imposing on Canadians a way of life that they do not want to live. And I do not believe that Canadians should be made to, to drive less or to farm less, especially farm less. We have a global insecurity in food. We have a global food shortage. And, and you know, there's a lot of joking going around with a plant outside of London, Ontario, and, and four million crickets, and, and I'm not eating crickets. I think that we should be able to farm not less, we should farm more. And we should also, in order for us to get out of the economic mess that we're in, we need to turn Canada into natural resources superpower that we ought to be, instead of hindering our manufacturing of natural resources. Well, do I look like a guy Ten who eats crickets? You know? <laughs> I do want to say I would do away with the Trudeau uh, carbon tax on consumers and also repeal BC48 and C69, these thank, two very important things. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shiraz, and I don't think there are any crickets at home, whether eating or people watching. Very good discussion uh, amongst our three candidates. To wrap up our English language section of the debate, I'm now going to ask each of the three participating candidates to share any additional comments they wish members to hear before we move to the French language section of the debate. Each of you will get two minutes, and we'll begin with Scott Aitchison. Thanks, Rob. You know, our answer to Justin Trudeau's divisive politics cannot be more division. We must lead with respect. We have to offer real solutions to the challenges Canadians face every day and, and produce a government that actually delivers results. We can't be the party that just rails against government. We have to be the party that offers better government, that actually 
respects taxpayer dollars and delivers results. We also have to come together as conservatives. I would point out in the last little discussion there that Roman answered my question, but Jean did not, about what happens after this leadership race. We have to come together. Whoever the leader of the party is on September the 11th, every one of us must come together. And I challenge every candidate in this race to stand up and say that they will come together. They will work with the conservative movement, whoever the leader is, work with our team in Ottawa to make sure that we are united, that we are presenting a conservative, principled, conservative, consistent message, and that we defeat Justin Trudeau in the next election. We simply cannot do it unless we are united. Canadians are frustrated. They are looking for an alternative. They don't, they, Justin Trudeau didn't win the last election. We lost it. We have to do better. Canadians deserve better government. Canadians deserve better from us. And so I encourage you, look at my plan. I talk about real solutions that actually present solutions to the problems that Canadians face every single day. Not just taglines, not just talk, not just Justin Trudeau style photo ops, but real solutions. Check out votescott.ca. You can read all about it there, and no matter what happens on September the 10th, I commit that as Conservatives, I will work as a member of the team, as a member of Parliament, I will work with our team to bring our caucus together, to bring our movement together, and to make sure that we defeat Justin Trudeau in the next election. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Roman Baber, you now have two minutes. Thank you, Rob. Um, my dear Canadians, I'm optimistic because the media is turning on Justin Trudeau. And many of his ministers are now on the ropes and Canadians are tired of this unscientific COVID response and the divisive tone that the Prime Minister insists on. I personally cannot wait for the next general election. I never wanted to win an election this badly because frankly, our country is at stake. And I hear all this talk uh, about division in our party and, and people that are not on the leadership ballot talking about alternatives, it saddens me immensely. So. I want you to imagine a scenario. It's the day after the election and you wake up and Justin Trudeau is re-elected Prime Minister. Or even worse, Christia Freeland is Prime Minister now. Not good, right? Well, we're counting on each other to make sure that this does not happen. And that means that we must stick together for the sake of our nation. We all need to take a step back, take a deep breath, simmer down. Our party is almost 700,000 members strong. It's a credit to every leadership contestant in this race. On September 10th, I will stretch out all five, eight and a half inches of me to embrace and unite this party, regardless of who wins. And I'm counting on each one of my friends to come along and do the same. And I also want to ask you to rank me first. There's no vote splitting as long as you mark another candidate second. If I don't win, then once I fall off the ballot, your vote will go to your second choice. You will still get the result that you like. But no, it doesn't work the other way around. If you mark me second, I may not get your vote if your first unless your first choice finishes last. So please mark me first to reject the COVID policies of the last two years. Please mark me first to send a message to the Conservative Party that it must stand on principle even when it's difficult. And mark me first to have a strong democratic movement Thank you, Mr. within Bauer. our party. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baber. Jean Charest, you now have two minutes. Roman Baber, Scott Aitchison, and I all agree on one thing. If we are going to unite the party, you have to show up. You actually have to show up. You have to speak to the membership. You can't treat them with contempt. At this point in the leadership race, about close, what, maybe 25% of members have voted, 75% of you have not yet cast your ballot. This is the moment where you are the one who should be holding us accountable on what it is that we're proposing in terms of leadership. I've led caucuses, federally. I've done it in a province, and I've done it successfully. I have a track record of uniting. And this party, if there's one thing this party has to sort out, more than anything else, because we paid a high price for it in 19 and 21, a very high price, and now the country's paying a high price for it, is getting our country, our party organized and united. I will do that. I know how to do it. It's what I've done all my life. And if we are able to do that, well, then that's the first condition to uniting the, part, the country. 
This country is crying out for our leadership. There is a boulevard out there of Canadians who want a fiscally conservative government who's going to have a real economic plan for the country and also understands that we can't get big projects done. We can't get pipelines done. We can't get energy projects done unless there's a national government. And it would be a breath of fresh air, ladies and gentlemen, to actually have a prime minister in Canada who lives outside of the Ottawa bubble, whether it's the media or it's the political parties or the bureaucracy, and actually understands how this country works, respects the provinces, respects his own party members, and is able to make this country work to the benefit of all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Shara. This brings to a close the English language section of the debate. Although candidates will be free to give their closing statements in the official language of their choice after the French language section of the debate. Uh, Mesdames et Messieurs, après cette courte pause de 30 secondes. Ladies and gentlemen, after a brief 30 second pause, we will begin the French language debate. Thank you. So very wow. uh, interesting so far. The the room setup is very bizarre. They're at the end of a table together. Uh, really quickly, just a yeah. few of the things I got. And when they go to the live debate, there will be live translations. We'll jump back to that, though. Um, Roman Babber staying true to form, um, uh, remaining strong on those sort of core freedom issues. I absolutely was laughing when he started talking about... Uh, I'm not eating crickets. That's one thing we can all agree on, and all of them seem pretty opposed to that. Um, Shere, actually, I was pretty impressed, I'm not going to lie, with his answers on Indigenous issues, uh, saying we're going to get th them water very sort of urgently. Um, everybody says we're going to do something about this, but he seemed to have an actual um, bit of that anger and fervor when you actually believe the things that he's saying. So I thought he was rather strong on that uh, Indigenous front, Scott Aitchison, honestly, he's just kind of there. Um, it, he's very generic, very reminiscent of Aaron O'Toole. Um, I don't think I identify him with anything other than being kind of like an inst institution Aaron O'Toole guy. What was your sort of reaction there? I, I would say, first of all, okay, um, Barber is the only one who bring the Arif Khan problem, um, especially because this is a really a real problem in Canada that threatening so much Canadian with unjustified fine and quarantine, and nobody yeah. have talked about it. Shari didn't uh, bring that up, and HSN as well. This is really a big concern, and I'm really surprised that he didn't mention it, as well as the indigenous people. We know that uh, Mr. Shari was a uh, premier for nine years. Where is your work on that? Where is your yeah. work with the um, uh, Canada government, with the prime minister of Canada? Where is your debate on that? You didn't do anything and nothing has changed for the uh, indigenous people in Quebec as well. So yeah, maybe you are really strong on that position, but show me, show me the results, show me the proof that you really want to go there. Because some, now I just believe that is word for me because what we saw so far from him in Quebec is not what we heard from him. And uh, as well, like everybody was talking about indigenous people, but nobody have talked really about the fact that the Pope came here, 80 years old person came here. Uh, it was not in good shape as well, but Justin Trudeau have actually strongly asked him to come, but nobody have bring that up that the government have a role on this and that probably, yeah, I'd like some stuff that we should have probably work on it way before and that probably the government have should have been accountable, being taking accountable of what happened to them too. So, um, yeah. Well, I, just on, on that note quickly, I will say though that in fact, there are no long-term advisories in Quebec, Alberta, British Columbia. So I'm not sure if he addressed any of them specifically, but they tend to be within Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ottawa, as far as current long-term drink water advisories in place, there are none in British Columbia, Alberta, or Quebec. Now, did he have anything to do with that? I don't know. Maybe they they were already addressing those issues. Maybe he was advocating for it. But I also liked, and I'll, I'll keep an eye out, or an ear out, rather, for when the debate goes live again. If, 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 Efron, if you could let me 
know. Um, but I, I liked how he was talking about not ambiguous terms about respect and uh, community. Some of the, the talking points other people were talking about, he was talking about agency and ownership and a sense of pride and instilling that active participation in betterment of community, which is sort of to contradict or contrast this bigotry of low expectations where some people think we need to do everything for Indigenous communities. I like that Jean Charest was saying we need to get them to do things for their own communities. Um, I, I, I think he was strong on that. I think, like I said, Aitchison didn't really stand out to me on much. Roman ba mm -hmm. Babber definitely nailing it on the head as he has been for some time on these freedom issues. One of the sort of principal people who like Todd Lowen, the UCP leadership in Alberta paid an actual political price for taking a stand. He is going to continue to resonate and maybe even grow among people where that's their principal concern. Polyev might lose a few points to him on that front remains to be seen. Um, but it, interesting sometimes Charest, for all the predispositions you may have about him, he comes out and says some pretty concrete uh, uh, things things that are that are not necessarily completely out of sync with with something i might agree with yeah of course like yeah, i would say shine was really strong on that point he probably gained a lot uh, of point on this um but as i say like i would believe when it will be done or when it will really came with yeah. like a really concrete like plan saying like okay we're going to do this and this yeah. but for now for me it's word I know him, he's always been a good talker, a strong talker, always yeah. with good, good plan, good, good policy. But um, yeah. I know from being like my premier, like he, he said like he was decreasing some tax, but yeah. he was incre increasing some tax for mm -hmm. some people who were not capable to pay it, like uh, rising the scholarship um, uh, fee and as well like for the um the health system so where actually we need that and we need people to go to school but increasing that oh but yeah. we need we'll, to go we'll back jump, but I, I we'll jump back, back for sure and i do like that metric of sort of skepticism because if we believed everything justin trudeau said well all the water issues would be resolved and everyone would be living in paradise so uh good to have that experience <laughs> and skepticism let's jump right back into it here so folks don't miss out with the french language debate yeah. minutes. Thank you. I would also like to welcome uh, Roman Baber and Scott Atchison, who are here tonight. They both believe strongly in democracy, as I do. And out of respect uh, to you, uh, members, uh, it's uh, good that we're here to defend our ideas in a public forum. That is the crux of what we will have to do after the leadership race is done. The first job uh, I will have as leader is is to do that. In 2019, 2021, we were divided. Canadians didn't elect the Liberal Party. We practically handed them the election. Millions of Canadians want a government that is fiscally conservative, that has a clear economic plan that can lead the country and that can put major projects in place. So the first 100 days as the new leader will uh, be focused on party unity, on working with activists to prepare the election campaign. This is a minority government and we might find ourselves facing an election very quickly. I have campaigned in federal elections, in provincial elections successfully. But we need a leader who is ready to do that and who's ready from day one. I am the person who can unite the party and who can unite the party so we can unite the country. Thank you, Mr. Roman Weber. 90 seconds. Thank you. As Prime Minister, I would uh, bring together a team of competent people to bring back a culture of professionalism to the government. This is something we owe every Canadian so that we can also try to reduce our regional divisions. We need to get life back to normal. Canadians can make their own medical decisions in consultation with their doctors. The vaccine is not preventing transmission and must be an individual choice, the COVID-19 vaccine, that is. I would end the vaccine mandate across the country. 
This is the greatest threat to our democracy. I would eliminate funding for Radio Canada, CBC Radio Canada, and I would not have government support for media. I would abolish the carbon tax and the anti pipeline legislation so that we can transform our country into a natural resource superpower. I would also open a legal investigation because we need a competent government that's responsible and that works for every Canadian. Thank you, Mr. Baber. The next answer will be by Mr. Scott Atchison. One minute, 30 seconds, please. My priority for the first 100 days as leader will be um, this practically the same as yours, gentlemen. We need to remember that Justin Trudeau could call an election at any time. Not uh, necessarily because uh, he's worried about me, but we need to unite the party. We have no choice but to do that. Secondly, we have to appoint a campaign team and take the best organizers from all of our own campaigns who have shown how competent they are. We will need a committee that includes both a caucus and a party members. My priority for the first 100 for the first 100 days of a conservative government would be to invite all premiers to improve the health care system in Canada to put in place measures that would put an end to supply management because of course that needs to go, but we need to get something back from the Americans. We need to make public our plan to eliminate the deficit and uh, restore confidence to investors and Canadians. Lastly, we need to make sure that we implement measures for IMBI to work in my backyard. Thank you. Canadians living in our rural communities often feel excluded from government decisions. Everywhere we look, we see that, be it high-speed internet uh, that's lacking or the policies uh, of the Trudeau government of, in rural communities. Farmers need fertilizer, for example. How would you make sure that rural areas will have the attention they need under your leadership, Mr. Roman Baber, you have a minute and 30 seconds. The best thing we can do to improve opportunities in rural Canada is uh, to have work and jobs there. The policies of the Liberal government are preventing workers from benefiting from agriculture and natural resources. There is a lack of food worldwide, but Justin Trudeau wants to reduce agriculture and farming. We need to do the opposite. We need to encourage farming for export. We need to feed Canadians and export food. I believe that our natural resources are a blessing, and I will not allow petroleum and gas to be cancelled. Mining operations are important too. People in the world, the world needs precious metals, and I would make it possible for our mining industry to operate responsibly. This would be tremendous for communities in the north, for indigenous people, and it is the only way to make sure that roads and infrastructure are built in regions where they're needed. This will bring opportunities to rural areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baber. Mr. Scott Aitchison, one minute, 30 seconds. I am a member of parliament, and I represent a rural riding. So I'm well aware of rural Canada's reality. Rural Canada has been forgotten by Justin Trudeau's liberals. They promised billions for high-speed internet in remote regions, and yet this 
contemporary infrastructure is embarrassingly slow to be deployed and is simply not available in too great a number of communities. Rural areas need internet just like people in the cities do. The housing crisis in uh, small rural communities is also just as serious than it is in the cities. And the millions and billions promised by Justin Trudeau's government haven't materialized. There is a serious crisis in rural Canada. Grocery bills are out of control and supply management is making food prices increase. Supply management uh, needs to go because that would make it possible to restore family farms in rural areas. I can assure you that my housing plan will also cover small towns across Canada. I would eliminate Justin Trudeau's carbon tax that weighs on consumers and encourage Canadians to reduce their carbon footprint. Thank you. Mr. Jean Charest, you have one minute and 30 seconds. Thank you. This really is one of the major issues uh, for the Canadian economy. We need uh, rural areas so that Canada can prosper. We must never forget that the mining sector, which is uh, mostly located in Quebec, uh, provides thousands of jobs and indirectly more thousands in Montreal, Toronto, Calgary, and we really need to see the link between uh, mining and jobs. We need to support rural areas. I have always supported the natural resources sector. The plan I have put forward for the North shows that clearly. But that's not the only issue. We also need high-speed internet, health services. There was a uh, an article on Fubu Island uh, in the Maritimes. There's no doctor on the island. The availability of uh, doctors is paramount. When I was in government, I did something that worked very well. Uh, Sherbrooke University opened a branch in Moncton and was training doctors in the community, and they stayed in the community. We could do that. It, and we've done the same thing in the Saguenay. But to achieve this, we need a government that can think broadly enough and can put forward solutions like that instead of just taxing people in rural areas, which is what Mr. Trudeau's government is doing. Thank you. As I said in English, for the next two questions, there will be an open debate at the end of the question and answer session. As moderator, I reserve the right to ensure that all candidates have equal time during the open debate. Here is the question. Inflation is the highest it's been in 40 years. Interest rate increases are the strongest tool the Bank of Canada has to fight persistent inflation. However, High interest rates have a cost on uh, people's mortgages and household expenditure. In your view, what are the best measures the government can take to make life more affordable for Canadians? Mr. Scott Aitchison, one minute and 30 seconds, please. First of all, there is no miracle solution to fight inflation. You can't uh, fire a government employee, and it's a real challenge needing a real solution as well as a budgetary discipline. As leader of the Conservative Party, my top priority will be to make life more affordable for all Canadians. We will eliminate the carbon tax. We would save money, uh, consumers would save money on uh, gasoline and heating. By eliminating supply management, we will prevent the prices of uh, foods like eggs, milk, and chicken from increasing. My plan will build more housing and make housing more affordable. There is a housing crisis in this country. Housing prices have doubled since Justin Trudeau was first elected. We will considerably increase the housing supply in Canada. We will restore the, a balanced budget. And once we've done that, we will start bringing down your taxes, pay
paying back the debt, and that will make life more affordable for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Mr. Jean Charest, you have a minute and 30 seconds. That is the subject that most people in the party talk about, inflation, access to housing, property. There's no miracle solution. We do need to bring down government spending because government spending increases inflation. We know that. The Bank of Canada should have started increasing interest rates earlier. It should have started uh, around the end of January. That is what I believe. The other policy consideration would be to reduce personal income tax. That's what I did during the 2008-2009 recession because that makes it possible for people to have more money in their pockets. It increases their disposable income. Scott Aitchison wants to eliminate supply management. I want to make it clear that I support supply management. If you're a party member who's directly affected by supply management, I think you'll find in me the only candidate who will support it, especially in a period where uh, supply chains are breaking down. In my view, stability for Canada's rural sector and the people living in it are, is paramount. Scott, you would eliminate supply management and negotiate something uh, for it with the U.S. Mr. Charest, there will be an open debate where you can uh, elaborate on that. We will now ask Mr. Roman Baber uh, to speak. You have one minute and 30 seconds, Mr. Baber. Thank you. It is important for us to recognize what is at the root of uh, this inflation. It's not just the two and a half billion dollars that we have borrowed in the last year. It is the lockdowns that have uh, made our economy grind to a halt. The supply chain has been halted worldwide a number of times, and our economy simply can't meet demand. Now, what can we do to fight inflation? We need to provide stability in the markets. I will never stop the economy. I will never go back to lockdown. I will restore discipline in government, abolish the carbon tax uh, from the very first day. I will also bring down income tax. We need to do everything we can to make life more affordable for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Baber. We will now move to the open debate, four minutes, on this topic. Mr. Aitchison, please begin. Mr. Charest, if we put an end to supply management, grocery bills would be lower and there would be new opportunities for Canadian farmers. I'm talking about opportunity, but the main issue now is housing. If you don't have the means to buy a house today, you probably or perhaps will never be able to. And that urgently needs to change. That is why I have a YIMBY plan, yes, in my backyard. Scott, your position on supply management has been very clear, as is mine. And I'm happy to talk about it with uh, people in your riding and in, in Quebec to see exactly what it would cost to put an end to supply management. You say you'd abolish it and then negotiate with the Americans. Well, if you abolish it, what's your leverage then? Supply management provides for stability in supply and stable prices and gives people in the regions a stable source of revenue on the ability to purchase property. We need to look at urban development and build more housing. We need to encourage immigrants who have build who have skills in the building trade to come to Canada and build. We need to encourage more 
higher density housing, we need to work with the provinces and municipalities to move ahead so that we can uh, provide incentives. One thing I would do is to establish a capital gains a hiatus, a pause in capital gains for people who sell housing, provided that they reinvest those funds in, in housing. This would make it possible for us to catch up on building more homes. Thank you, Mr. Charrier. Mr. Baber, do you have uh, anything else to add? All right. We'll move to the last question. Over 5 million Canadians cannot get care from a health professional. The provinces and territories have united in asking the federal government to invest more in health care. What role can the federal government play in dealing with the health care crisis? We'll begin with Mr. Jean Charest, one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. As a subject, as a topic, this is certainly a top priority for Canadians. It was bad before COVID, and now it's worse. As Prime Minister, in the first 100 days of my government, I would bring together all premiers in a provincial, in a federal provincial uh, territorial meeting, in a meeting co-chaired by the premiers. And health would be number one on the agenda. We'd also talk about housing, the economy, all the major themes that we have to deal with together if we are to come up with solutions. I would allow the provinces to innovate. I would allow the private sector to play a role. But let's be careful. They would have a role within the framework of a public system. You would not be asked to pay more. Let's be clear. We would simply allow private uh, clinics, for example, who do hip and knee surgery to provide those surgeries effectively at a better price so that we can remove some patients from hospitals where they don't need to be and uh, provide care, provide more intensive care. The federal government can provide a platform that makes us draw talent to Canada and uh, qualify foreign trained immigrants. And yes, the federal government should participate in the federal, provincial, territorial meetings instead of turning its back. Mr. Baber, one minute, 30 seconds. We do have a health care crisis. Emergency rooms uh, around the country are in difficulty because of a uh, shortage in, in staff. We need to change what we're doing. We took, we pulled off a lot of healthy workers from uh, wards and hospitals because they did not want to be vaccinated. All employees have to be allowed to come back to work. We need to recognize that Canada has the most inefficient health care system in the developed world. We have less than we have fewer beds uh, per capita than any other OECD country. So I would invest in building hospitals. And that is something I would discuss with the provinces and territories. Thank you, Mr. Baber. Mr. Scott Aitchison, you have one minute and 30 seconds. Thank you. We have a fragile health care system. We think we have a great system because it's better, for example, than that in the U.S. And we think that it means we have the best system in the world, but we don't. We should not be afraid of debating the issue, and we should examine other models that are uh, effective in other countries, like uh, the one in the Netherlands. The system we have here was based on a promise that the federal government would uh, provide and cover 50% of health care costs, but it doesn't. 
Today, the federal government pays only 20 percent of costs. There is no easy answer to this, but we have to uh, discuss the issue and work uh, with provinces and territories to improve our health care system. We can work with the provinces to increase capacity in our hospitals, reduce waiting times, and increase the number of beds available. We need to find um, means of spending less on managing health care and more on actually providing it to patients. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Let's now move to the four minutes of open debate. Mr. Charret, you begin. Our health care system needs to be overhauled, and it is more than urgent for us to talk to the provinces and fix it. The problem we had was a capacity issue. Why does Canada and why did Canada impose the most astringent measures in the world? Because, because we needed to do that. We have to work closely with the provinces. And that's what I've done. The most significant agreement on health was signed when Stephen Harper was in opposition. We were increasing funding by 6 percent a year. We had in that agreement recognition of asymmetric federalism and full compliance with provincial areas of jurisdiction. The premiers got together and uh, basically uh, asked Mr. Trudeau, who's missing in action, to respond to their province, their prompt, their demands, and what are we getting? Radio silence. Then he seems prepared to increase funding with strings attached. But you know, let's let's worry about something. A government that can't manage a passport office, I doubt very much, could manage emergency rooms. And if that is Mr. Trudeau's intent, let's make sure that we can get to a point where a conservative government is elected, a government that can run the country properly. Mr. Baber, we have a labor shortage. We need to hire all Canadians who are willing and able we need more workers in the health care system and a greater focus on health care. We must never be in a position where there is a lack of equal access to medical care and health care in general. I would reform the Canada Health Act to protect each and every Canadian's medical choices. Thank you, Mr. Baber. Mr. Aitchison? No, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. We all agree that there is a labor shortage, a staffing shortage in the health care center. Uh, people are exhausted. We know their heroes, nurses, doctors have been exceptional. But here's what the federal government can do. There can be a specific immigration plan, a platform to recruit immigrants who are specialized in some areas of health care, nurses, physicians, support staff, and make sure that their qualifications can be recognized. That is under provincial jurisdiction. But if we had a creative approach, we could establish a common platform across all provinces and territories to recognize people's qualification and make it easier and faster for people to come to the country and work in health care. Thank you, Mr. Charré. Thank you, gentlemen. Candidates uh, now have a last opportunity to speak to their voters in the language of their choice. Candidates participating in the language of their choice to give one last pitch to Conservative Party members. And I know there's lots of discussion in the party about uh, organizers and the leadership election organizing committee that. Uh, crack down on candidates and impose all sorts of uh, sanctions or penalties. But we do do nice things for leadership candidates as well. So uh, we, uh, we have some extra time, and so we're going to provide an extra minute to each of the three candidates to make their final closing pitch to members. Quatre minutes chacun, three minutes, four minutes each. Four. Commençons avec Monsieur Scott Aitchison. Thanks, Rob. Canadians are so frustrated 
with this government. They are looking for a credible alternative. And the majority of Canadians are just fed up with Justin Trudeau. But we must earn their respect as Conservatives and be united if we are to form the next government. We're not going to win in places like the island of Montreal, the lower mainland of BC, Atlantic Canada, the GTA around Toronto, unless we are addressing the real concerns of Canadians who live in these areas and all Canadians, regardless of their religion or ethnicity, see themselves reflected in our Conservative Party. That's why I have led by offering real solutions to today's challenges. Mes critiques diront que mon français n'est pas assez bon. And some would say my French is not good enough. It's true. But I will continue to work on this. I'm going to redouble my efforts. And I promise that between now and the next election, I will be fluent in English and French. Whether or not I win this race, as a proud member of the, par of the party in Parliament, I will continue to serve in the House of Commons and stand up for the values that we fought for in this leadership campaign. Can the others say the same tonight? John, I asked you earlier, you've given a lot to this country, but you didn't answer the serious question about your leadership and your dedication to the party if you don't win. Our party, our team, must be committed, and we, our members must be focused on uniting our party and dedicated to its future, offering real solutions. Can you honestly say that if you do not win this race, that you will be here on September 11th helping Leslin Pierre and me unite our party. I will continue to be a part of the Conservative team, fighting in Ottawa to hold Justin Trudeau to account and always looking for ways to deliver results that makes the lives of Canadians better. That's what I've always done in public life. Canadians deserve so much better from their federal government. And frankly, Canadians deserve better from us. Justin Trudeau did not win the last election. We lost it because we didn't get our act together. We have to do it this time, and we have to come together. This leadership campaign has been divisive and in sometimes cases embarrassing. We have to come together, and we must unite as a team, as a caucus, as a movement, and present a clear, principled, consistent conservative message to Canadians and speak to the issues that matter to Canadians in all parts of the country not just our rural base. We have to address issues that matter to Canadians where we have not won in the last several elections. And we can't do that if we're fighting amongst ourselves. I will lead our team by bringing it together and working with that team, we will build that principled, inclusive, and positive conservative platform that will deliver results for Canadians from coast to coast to coast. I ask for your help to make this happen. When you cast your ballot, please vote Scott Aitchison, number one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. We turn now to Robin Babber, four minutes. Thank you, Rob. Um, um, I'm just, I'm going to abandon the notes and, and speak from the heart like I typically do. I'm genuinely concerned about the erosion of democracy in our country and, of course, the erosion of opportunity. Uh, I came to Canada when I was 15 and we didn't have a cent to our name. Um, my dad sold ice cream on those Dixie bicycles, but I've always had a job and I've always had this remarkable joy because I had Canadian opportunity. This country has given me every opportunity to work, to, to go to school, to join a, a big firm and then uh, go on my own and, and join a small firm and grow a small business. It's a remarkable blessing. I've always felt that this is the best country in the world because all you needed to do to succeed in Canada is just work hard and be nice to people. That's it. And if you just did those two things, then everything will be okay. And we get to do that and we get to keep our religious values and cultural values. We get to be ourselves. Um, this, is, uh, this country is such a blessing. And I'm not prepared to let it go. And I'm genuinely worried when I see 15% of Canadians still being treated like second-class citizens when we see censorship on social media and on the news media, when we see our freedom of speech erode, for what? We know what the line is. Do not, God forbid, incite violence. Do not demonize an identifiable group of people like the Prime Minister does. But short of that, we have the right to be wrong. And whatever happened to, I might disagree with you, but I'll still defend your right to say it. 
We must preserve our freedom of speech because the freedom of speech is the holy grail of all rights. Because through speech we defend all the other rights and other Canadians. This is a legacy that we must cherish, our ability to disagree with each other respectfully. I also want to give you a little bit of, of strategy. A lot of folks ask me, Roman, we can't wait three years anymore. What are we going to do with, with this coalition government? And I say, well, first of all, I don't think we're going to have to wait that long. And if the rumors of a fall election are true, I say bring it on. We can't afford another day of Justin Trudeau. But the key to all of this is Jagmeet Singh. Jagmeet Singh is the weak link. And I hold and I invite each of you to hold uh, Jagmeet Singh responsible for everything that this Justin Trudeau government does. He knows he's in trouble. He abandoned labor. He knows that he didn't stand up for their jobs. He knows that his organizers on the ground, the union bosses, they did not stand up for labor. And now is an opportunity for us because we are going to stand up for Canadian workers. And finally, I ask that you rank me first because we have to get out of this mess. We have to end this nightmare that we've been living for two and a half years. There's nothing else. Most of us had COVID. 85% of us are vaccinated. Canadians are suffering from a mental health post-trauma, and they're not going to begin to heal until we move past this public health exercise and just allow ourselves to make our own choices. And it's also very important that history regards everything that happened fairly, that the tactics that were used against Canadians for the first time, like segregation and psychological manipulation and censorship, that they're not viewed justifiable in the future. Because if somehow history regards them fairly, then we will never get our democracy back and we will never fully go back to normal. And I find those two propositions unacceptable. We're getting our democracy back and we're going back to normal. Full stop. That's why I'm here. And that's why I ask that you rank me first. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Baber. We'll now move to Jean Charest. The final word, uh, four minutes, sir. Thank you very much. Et Rob, je fais mes remarques à la fois en anglais et en français. Rob, I'll be commenting in both English and French. Political life. Leadership is about showing up. Showing up in all circumstances. It's about being accountable to the members of the party, you, the ones who decide who the next leader will be and answering questions and debating with other candidates. All my life, I've showed up. We were badly defeated in 1993 as the Progressive Conservatives. There was two members left. I was the only one re-elected. I didn't walk away. I showed up. I stayed to rebuild the party. To great sacrifice for which I'm eternally indebted to my wife, Michelle, and the family. But I did it out of conviction. In 95, there was a referendum. I showed up. In 98, there was a call to go fight another referendum in Quebec. I showed up. In 97, we had a federal campaign. We went from two to 20 members. I showed up. I showed up at every moment when it was important for the country, when it was important for my party, when it was important for the future of Canada. Leadership is about fighting and showing up. It isn't about running away. In this leadership race, I've met with thousands of conservatives across the country. By the way, of all stripes and colors, and we're not hyphenated conservatives, that's not what we want for the future, but there are conservatives in this party who believe in families, who believe in issues that are faith-based, for example. All of you have a place at the table. I want you to know that. A political party is a living institution. We have shared values. Fiscal conservatism, market-based economy, economic policies that promote economic growth. We believe in families, plural. We also believe, by the way, in law and order, which is fundamental to the freedoms in our society. And none of us have the luxury, by the way, especially if you're a legislator, to go out there and encourage people to break laws. And that doesn't mean that we hinder free speech. Quite to the contrary. Believe me, I've been around long enough and on both sides to know that every single citizen in this country has a right to speak out. And none of us should have been subjugated to what the Trudeau government imposed with the War Measures Act, which became the Emergencies Act. It was quite unbelievable. And Roman, I know you feel strongly about that. You paid a price for it. 
And that I find to be very admirable. Showing up also means, in the end, uniting this party. There are millions of Canadians who want us as Conservatives to be that national alternative. Now, let me add this. A lot of Canadians are also tired, they're frustrated, some of them are angry. But anger is not a political program. The challenge of real sh leaders who show up is to take that and to translate that into something positive for the future of the country, to a program, to uniting the party, to unite the country, to make it work, because we know we can do better. Nous pouvons, nous les conservateurs, être justement cet We can be that instrument of unity. We have been an instrument of unity in the past, and I will unite the party in the future. I've been a conservative, and I believe in conservative values. I led a coalition government in Quebec because, as a conservative, I believed in the unity of this country. I'm not going to change, but I'm going to be the leader of this party. You have a vote, you have a voice, and you have a choice as a member of this party. And I am asking you to support me so that we can do the job we need to do to unite the party and unite the country. Thank you, Mr. Chara. I want to thank uh, all of our candidates who are participating tonight, Roman Baber, Scott Aitchison, Jean Chara, for being here. On behalf of the Leadership Election Organizing Committee, including the debate committee of Rick Eckstein, Deanne Carey, and Eleanor Miller, I hope tonight's debate has given Conservative Party members who haven't voted more to think about. As of last night, we have received approximately 150,000 ballots. This means that the vast majority of Conservative Party members have yet to vote. To be counted, your ballot needs to be received in Ottawa by September 6th. If you have questions, please go to the party's website, www dot conservative dot ca www.conservateur.ca www www the results will be announced on september 10th at the shaw center in ottawa please join us either in person at the shaw center in ottawa on september 10th or watch the results at home online or on your preferred source of news please vote we have set record numbers 678,000 plus Conservatives eligible to vote never seen before in Canadian history. Be part of the change. Be part of history to change Canada for the better. No matter how long you have been a member of the Conservative Party, no matter why you joined, no matter who you support in this leadership race, you have a home in this party. Vous êtes chez vous au Parti Conservateur du Canada. You have a home in Canada's Conservative Party. We are stronger when everyone is engaged. Our next Prime Minister is just a vote away. Good night et bonne soirée. The debate oh. has come to... And so to the final Conservative leadership debate has now ended. Let that Andrew close Thompson off. back with you on CPAC. And in a few moments, those hopefuls... There we oh. go. So the live of, live event Finished. is over. The debate has ended there, but don't go anywhere yet. We are hoping to join the live scrum. And while the live debate can very often be uh, a little bit rehearsed and, and structured, very often the, the real interesting tidbits, the sound bites that really make headlines come from the scrum. So as we mentioned, we spoke with William before the uh, debate started. He's on the ground. We're hoping he's going to ask some really incredible questions. Looking forward to that. We're going to go to those questions in the scrum live as soon as it begins but uh, i just wanted to take a couple of minutes to sort of gauge your reaction uh, did anyone stand out to you as as a winner did anyone stand out to you as a loser what was your take on the uh, the participation in the debates that would be interesting to see like what the viewer have to say about it like please if you want like you write to us and uh write to us a, a chat to say like what do you think about like the performance of the all the candidates and uh what do you think about like what the answer as well as a question uh i will say for myself uh, i was really uh happy of what actually i really like the answer of uh roman barber uh when he actually speak out without his note and just speaking from the heart and i i really feel it was really sincere 
when he was talking about what he see as a future for Canada and what he don't don't want to see as well. So I really enjoy that. But I would say that I'm really surprised on myself to agree with what Mr. Shari say about building home, but we don't have nobody to build it. It's really hard to find some people in the industry of building home who have the time to, to, to build some new home. So I was agreeing with him when he said that we should let the immigrant to practice their, um, like some immigrant that they are, they perform on that field to allow them when they come to Canada to build a home because here in the industry it's crazy. Like trying to find mm -hmm. someone, it takes like a year from now to say, do you have the time? Do you have like some availability? They don't have any. Well, and that's a rampant problem. You even have people with like engineering degrees, ba serious backgrounds in high demand jobs, uh, but there aren't processes in place to acknowledge their education from another country. So they're taking jobs, not that there's anything wrong with this, but they're taking like delivery jobs or working, skip the dishes or doing whatever they can do driving Uber while there's a high demand for skilled medical professionals, engineers, whatever it may be. Um, I do want to take just a minute now to remind folks before we get into this, because we're about six minutes out from the scrum starting but i do want to encourage everybody who is watching just consider going to leadershipreports.ca checking out some of the content check out those conversations see if we're asking some of the important questions that you want answers to that no one else is asking and then consider kindly supporting the work that we're doing um, whether you like it or not the cbc and these mainstream media outlets through bailouts are reaching into your pockets and they're taking money whether you like it or not and it's a lot more than you would like or a lot more than you would think uh, Roman Babber there said that that our, our right to speak and our freedom of speech is pivotal. Well, media is an instrumental part of that fundamental right. And we need independent outlets like ourselves that come with the other outlets to be out there asking tough questions on the ground, doing on the ground, doing this nitty gritty journalism that needs to be done to hold politicians accountable. So consider going to leadershipreports.ca and making a contribution to help make all of this possible. We all work long days um, and, and, and work tirelessly to ensure that this country doesn't go down a path where politicians aren't held accountable anymore we can't allow that to take place consider chipping in um as we wait for the questions to roll in i just thought i'd give my sort of two cents on on what i gathered from the debate um in in some order of who i thought was least significant to probably uh, might have won some more people over um scott Aitchison, it, when you hear him talk, it is so reminiscent of an institutional guy who's just kind of playing it safe. He kind of sounds like someone talking, I don't know, four years ago or 10 years ago, not the current Conservative Party, the excited and rejuvenated Conservative Party. I wrote down a bunch of words that he said. He, he echoed sort of the uh, unmarked mass grave rhetoric. He talked about truth and reconciliation, patriarchy, respect, social mobility, uh, net zero, uh, inclusivity. He said the one time he sort of challenged in any way, shape, or form the other people involved in the debates, he was like, we're very friendly and we get along, but I'm going to push back a little bit. Um, that That's not what we need. We had that with Andrew Shear. We had that with Aaron O'Toole. I'm sure Mr. Aitchison is, is a lovely person. It would be great to grab a beer with him, but that's what lost against Justin Trudeau twice already. We do not need that same type of politicking again. Jean Charest yeah. is interesting because he's probably the most popular, uh, in fact, polling suggests he's the most popular on not, on, on the front of non-sort of self-professed conservatives. So when he does say he, he has the best chance to win a majority, that might be backed up by the, the statistics and the polling. So Jean Charest is an interesting character because he says... Again, you, you rightly point out that he says a lot of things. Um, he he may not. Uh, I'm just hearing that the scrum is getting ready soon. So if, if we have to cut away, we'll do that quickly. He may not act on these things, but he's saying things that resonate. And his sort of liberal Quebec political background does put him in, in, in an interesting position to do reasonably well in terms of winning over non-conservative voters, but largely, aside from some strong talking points and maybe winning me over a little bit on Indigenous issues, 
it's kind of the same old. He, he He's doing better than I thought he would be in my books, but I still don't think he's challenging. It is unfortunate that we did not see two stronger candidates, Pierre Polievre and, uh, and uh, Lesson mm-hmm. Lewis present, Dr. Lesson Lewis present, because I think there would have been a little bit more pushback there. But Roman Babber uh, continues to be strong. He's ultimately saying the same things. He did say the same things in French as well as English. There wasn't much of that double speak, depending on the language. Um, But I I found that he was consistent, and uh, despite maybe having the weakest language skills in French, um, he did, in fact, probably drive home the strongest points. I liked when he joked about not eating crickets. Even in French, he said, I will defund Radio Canada. That is a non-backing down sort of position. So I, I thought as far as someone coming out, Despite it not necessarily being anything new, um, he, he took on some strong, strong points. Just getting some news in the uh, in, from the, from the studio here. I believe that Scott Aitchison um, is yeah. backing out of the scrum. Yeah. Um, so he is not going to be participating in the scrum anymore. Um, I believe they they're rolling the cameras on the scrum, but no one is there right now. I'd be surprised because Jean Charest tends to roll out for scrums period. Like he, he's been on a very small stage with me and Ezra Levant and four or five other people from independent media. And he did not back down at all. So I'd be surprised to see him miss this opportunity. Um, and Roman, Roman Nababer also not generally one to shy away from media. They're going to let us know when a politician is on stage, but w- what do you think of my sort of assessment there as far as where these three candidates are, are coming from and where they're probably going to resonate with most people? Um, I would say, well, you need to don't forget that Mr. Charest have like a big background of experience in politics and being like mm-hmm. as well the prime, we call it the prime minister in French, but the premier of Quebec for nine years. That's a big background. So he know where to go, mm-hmm. he know how to talk, he know what, what to do. He, he is really experienced in that field. So... Mm-hmm. As I say, it's really strong on what he say, and I agree for so many points what he say, but in the same time, what you say needs to go with what you do. So Mm -hmm. for this, it needs to be proved. Um, For Hinton, I would say, unfortunately, I have some trouble to really believe on. It's always so much in surface. It's not really going to dig too much, and uh, this is probably my problem with this but um what is your i really want to see your point of view because in the french debate they really touch the agriculture and the farmer and the um, the rural rural uh place um i know that alberta and and where you live it's mostly mostly what they it is so i find that they didn't touch as well like the agreement of Justin Trudeau when they say that it will lower the oh it's the oh, the scrum we, we'll come yeah, back it's the for, scrum. Uh, we'll jump I'm live saying. to the scrum and then we'll come back and wrap up afterwards yeah uh, was this a useful exercise are you happy you participated in this debate in this debate after all look I think I've done uh, well in the English portion of the debate for sure uh, I'm glad I get to speak about the environment I'm glad I got to speak about indigenous issues and uh, overall I'm, I'm pleased with my debate performance uh, I, I also wanted to re- reiterate um, a question that Scott Aitchison asked. Uh, he, he asked you and, and Mr. Charest um, if you were committed to the unity of the party, if you would unite with whom, whomever is elected on so- September 10th. So I just wanted to get your clear 100%. response. 100%. Um, look, I, I believe that the Conservative Party is ready to form government. I believe that Canadians are tired of the Justin Trudeau Liberals and they're genuinely seeking for an alternative. And I believe that the only thing that can stand in our way of winning the next federal election is if our party is not united. And I'm going to go out of my way, whether I win uh, the leadership or not, to do everything in my power to make sure that we remain united and committed to the Conservative Party. So, so just to be clear, should you not win the leadership, are you going to be r- running as an MP in the next election? Well, I, I certainly hope to win the leadership, in which case I'll certainly have to run. And uh, should I not be successful, uh, that's a decision that um, I guess I'll make with the leader of the party. Uh, Raphael Pierrot from Agence QMI. What do you think about uh, the fact that the front runner is not participating in this debate? Again, I'm not going to speak for other candidates. Um, look, um, 
I think it's important to appreciate that, as uh, Rob Batherson said, 150,000 ballots have already arrived at, at party headquarters. Can assume that there are a good number of ballots that are already in the mail. And so I, I understand uh, valid concerns with respect to whether each ballot is actually e equally weighed, given that some people are unable to form an opinion uh, on the basis of this debate subsequent to their ballot already being mailed. So I, I, I certainly think that, um, I'll, I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> are you scared of attacking him because he's the front runner? I'm, if there's anything I've, I've demonstrated over the last couple of years is that um, I'm not worried about politics, I'm worried about Canadians. Uh, and uh, I respect all of my friends in the race. Uh, what I will say, however, is um, I, I do agree with some of my friends that I wish the process was somewhat better. Uh, Boris Pro from the Devoir, you mentioned a few times your position to uh, COVID mandates. Um, what's the pertinence of that, knowing that most mandates are gone now? Well, I don't agree with that. I still have former constituents that are unable to visit loved ones in a long-term care home. We still have hospitals that do not allow family members to visit. We still have 15 to 20 percent of Canadians that are forced to be detained under threat of jail whenever they enter and exit Canada. We also have workers losing their jobs. I should mention this. Uh, I, got a, I, I got a message from a Hamilton firefighter who's telling me that he's about to lose his job and that city council in Hamilton is about to uh, vote on, on mandates for city workers. And I implore Andrea Horwath, who I understand is now running for mayor of the city of Hamilton, to speak out against the mandates, to reject the mandates. Her party was defeated over uh, her approach to COVID response, in my view, and she needs to stand up for Hamilton workers and all workers. And as prime minister, one of the first things I'll do is I will ban all passports and mandates, but I will go a step further. I will freeze funding to any province that permits them, either in its private sector or in its provincially regulated industry, like uh, colleges or, or hospitals or, or universities. I think that this is a shameful episode in Canadian history. We know that the passports do not stop the spread. They do not arrest the spread of COVID. And it's time that we stop segregating 15 to 20 percent of Canadians. Would you accept the tag of being anti the anti mandates uh, candidate, or perhaps um, I'm the choice candidate. And and look, we still believe that it's still a choice. I made the choice that most Canadians made, but that but we've never forced anyone to do anything against their will, and COVID is no reason to start, sir. Sir uh, William Diaz here with the Rebel News. Quick question for myself. Do you regard China as an ally or a, an enemy or a competitor? I think, I think we have to be very clear on China. And, and we should not be afraid as conservatives, and I certainly will never be afraid to articulate what I believe. China is locking down tens of millions of healthy people. It's putting ankle bracelets on people. China is engaging in, in segregation it's sending uh, Muslim Uyghurs to, lab to, to camps. It's something that the international community is silent about. If we say never again, then it should really be never again. China is stealing our intellectual property. They have uh, attacked and usurped democracy in Hong Kong. They're now eyeing Taiwan. Um, they're destabilizing the world. They're working closely with Iran. Um, and I think that it's time for the international community to gather some courage and call out China on, on its malfeasance against human rights internally and in the world at large. Yeah, uh, a second question for me, a last one. Alberta has, mo has some of the most uh, ethical oil on earth, both in terms of human rights and environmental concerns. Why are conservative leadership candidates uh, tiptoeing and apologizing around WEF climate language like net zero instead of doing the best thing that we could do here in Canada for the environment and sell our oil to foreign countries around the world. Venezuela and Ireland aren't playing these games themselves. Well, you certainly don't get any tiptoeing uh, with me when it comes to um, what I believe is a very misguided uh, net zero carbon policy. Uh, on the contrary, I believe that Canada's natural resources are a blessing, 
and I'm not going to let oil and gas be cancelled. And our natural resources are good not just for our strategic interest and our economic bottom line, they're great for the planet because Canadians can drive energy cleaner and safer than any other nation on earth. So I'm going to free Canadian oil and gas. Uh, I've been to Alberta three times since this leadership race began. Uh, I have a very robust Western Canada policy and uh, it's, it's not just great for, for Western Canada. I, I believe that the only way that we're going to get out of the fiscal hole that the Liberals are going to leave us in is to unleash the economic potential of our country. And I'm going to do that by turning Canada into a natural resources superpower. Thank you very much. Great questions, William. Good job, buddy. That's our own uh, William that was Diaz. Amazing. Yeah, really good. Hi, right. Mr. Mon nom est Jean Charest. Hi, Mr. Charest, Chris Ray on CBC. Good to see you again. Hi. Uh, uh, just to pick up on Mr. Aitchison's uh, question to you, will you stay in the party and, and run for it if you, if you don't win? It'll be a real honor for me to lead the party and become the next Prime Minister of Canada. And, you know, these questions come up in every leadership race. We're like boxers at the end of our match. I mean, we're in the 12th round, and, you, you know, we're interrupted to say, well, what will you do if you don't? The fact of the matter is, I'm focused on one single objective that I am going to meet, and that's becoming leader of the party and then Prime Minister of Canada, period. So if you lose, would you support Mr. Polyev? There is only, you... There's only one scenario possible. I will become the leader of the party. Thank you. Laurence Martin, Radio-Canada. Il uh, y a beaucoup de gens qui pensent que M. Poilier va l'emporter. Donc, M. Charest, le 11 septembre, si M. Poilier l'emporte, vous, est-ce que vous êtes... Vous restez au Parti conservateur du Canada? Je vais gagner Same la consolidation. C'est ma conviction exactly. profonde. Question. Et je vous invite à la prudence. Ce n'est pas la première fois que les gens prédisent qu'il va y avoir un, un résultat. Exact. Toute Same. ma vie, j'ai vécu avec ça. Toute ma vie. Alors, je peux vous dire, je suis probablement, pas probablement, je suis le politicien au Canada dont on a le plus prédit euh, la, la fin politique, la mort. Toute ma carrière, j'ai vécu avec ça. Ce n'est pas nouveau. Uh, il y a juste un scénario possible, c'est de gagner la course au leadership, d'unir le parti, d'unir le premier ministre. Les échanges étaient très courtois ce soir. Uh, certains diront qu'on n'a pas appris grand-chose de ce débat. Est-ce que vous pensez que finalement le format, le fait que vous ne soyez que trois, ça a donné raison? Finalement, M. Poilier, ne donne pas ce point. Ce ben, vous dites que le, le, le format ce soir, que c'était très courtois. Est-ce que vous ne trouvez pas étonnant? Que un, une formule et que les gens qui se traitent respectueusement soient l'exception à la règle. OK. Honnêtement. Again. En politique, Et si on se traite respectueusement, bien là, ça, ça paraît être une exception à la règle. Moi, j'ai vécu comme ça toute ma vie. J'ai traité mes Et adversaires politiques respectueusement. Je ne suis pas un enfant de cœur. Je ne veux pas vous donner l'impression que euh, je suis celui qui n'est pas... Euh, quand il est attaqué, qui ne répond pas. Ben, je suis, je suis capable de répondre, je suis capable d'en mettre, je suis capable de prendre des coups puis de donner des coups. Mais honnêtement, le fait de se traiter respectueusement ne devrait pas être l'exception, ça devrait être la règle. Je regrette que pour certains, puis je pense directement à M. Poliev, que ce ne soit pas le cas. Mais ça, c'est son choix à lui. Et ça, c'est une formule américaine. Hein? Ça, c'est la politique à l'américaine. Mais le Parti conservateur du Canada, ce n'est pas une pâle copie du Parti républicain. Et ça fait partie des choix que les membres et les militants auront à faire lorsqu'ils vont exprimer leur vote. Uh, good Party. evening, Mr. Charest. In a campaign mail-out, you stated recently that uh, vaccine mandates keep public sector workers safe. Do you believe COVID mandates should, be, uh, should continue to be implemented, or do you think it's time for the government to lift them once and for all? And if you've changed your mind from the past two weeks when you stated this in an in email, why is that? I don't think, think we've changed our mind. I mean, the fact of the matter is we're probably now entering into the seventh wave of COVID. Every wave has been different. Governments had no playbook, in fairness to all governments, by the way. Let's be fair. Provincial governments, federal government, no one had a playbook in going into this. And they handled every mm -hmm. wave based on the information they had. Are we going to return to lockdowns? No. And uh, should we impose mandates when we don't need them? Well, the answer is no. But every wave should be treated as such, and we should look at the consequences, and we should have the maturity, and we should have the wherewithal as leaders to make the best decision possible to protect the, li the life 
uh, of Canadian citizens. It's that's, that's the way to approach it. There's no other way to approach it. The second question for me is going to be the same one that I asked uh, Ro Rowan Baber. Do you regard China uh, as an ally or do you think it's a competitor and enemy that we should be scared of? Do you think we should be doing more deals with uh, this country? Uh, well, I wish you, you know, their, your question makes it sound simple. China is a superpower. In our lifetime, we've seen the emergence of China as a superpower. Canada needs to redefine its approach on foreign policy in general, by the way, and on defense. And I've spoken to that. And that includes our approach to how we handle our relationship with China. In certain areas, we need to push back on issues of human rights, of uh, spying or industrial spying. In other areas, we need to cooperate. That includes the issue of the environment, on issues like pandemics. So it's, it's not black and white, but we need to first of all define our interest. And what is urgent for Canada, and I will do as Prime Minister, is have an Indo-Pacific strategy that actually includes all of Asia, not just China. Southeast Asia, for example. ASEAN is part of that. Now, we've done a trade agreement with 11 countries within CPTPP. We have a free trade agreement with South Korea. We've now engaged in a trade agreement and trade negotiations with ASEAN, the 10 countries of ASEAN. And that's more than 600 million people and very much a, an opportunity for us. We should have on supply chains, for example, I'll give you a specific example, a China plus one policy. And what I mean by that is that no given company should be totally dependent on China for a supply chain. That's the kind of reason policies that we should have based on our national interest. But we have to rethink that through. Marshall McLeod with the Globe and Mail. To, to the Conservative who is still undecided between yourself and Mr. Pelliev, what would you say to them is the, the key difference between yourselves, both in terms of policy and, and as a leader? I would say this, and there's been two recent polls that corroborate this, the Ipsos poll and Angus Reid. The difference between Mr. Poliev and myself is simple. If I'm the leader, I will win a national majority government. If Mr. Poliev is the leader, conservatives will lose. The Angus Reid poll says this, I lead in British Columbia. I lead in Ontario, which has the most number of seats in Canada. It includes Quebec and the Atlantic. That's the difference between Mr. Poliev and myself. On policy, the Angus Reid actually tested five of my policies, five of his policies. Again, Canadians support the vast majority of my policies. And I put out very clear policies on how I think, how we'd run the country. It's the difference between content and slogans. That's the difference. And slogans is not going to do it for Canada. Take, take the issue of environment and climate. A slogan isn't going to do the job for us. We can only form government if we're serious enough to have a policy on the environment and climate and resources that uh, is real and credible. I've done that. I've been there. I've been in a federal government that did the Montreal Protocol, the Clean Air Act, and also a government that did Plan A. These are the things that we can do successfully if we're smart about it. Thank you. We have one more question, that's it. Oui. Uh, Monsieur Charret, Raphaël Pirot de l'agence QMI. Uh, un autre sujet, uh, le redécoupage électoral uh, propose en fait une diminution uh, du poids du Québec dans la fédération. On sait que vous voulez que chaque voix, chaque région dans le pays soit entendue uh, équitablement. Vous en faites uh, une proposition centrale dans votre, dans votre proposition. Uh, qu Qu'est-ce uh, vous, quelle est votre position là-dessus? On peut très bien maintenir les comtés au Québec et augmenter le nombre de comtés à l'extérieur du Québec pour tenir compte de l'augmentation de la population dans les comtés. Mais très bien. Le poids relatif. Pardon? Le poids relatif de la province du Québec. Bien, le poids relatif, actuellement, nous sommes à 78. Euh, ma position à moi, c'est qu'on devrait maintenir 78. Et comme c'est de la représentation par population, on devrait tenir compte de l'augmentation de la population ailleurs. Just Merci one, beaucoup. Bonne soirée. So shying away a little bit from saying that
Quebec should lose some of its voting weight and power. Mm -hmm. He said that we should maintain our roughly 68% share of the vote there, but we have to consider growing populations elsewhere. That's probably the first time in the evening that I I saw somebody not wanting to say, well, obviously Alberta needs more votes um, or something along those lines in French. But I I, I will applaud Charest for saying that that I'm not just going to say Quebec deserves more, other countries don't. Um, those those as i was saying right when this started those scrums those scrums tell you so much jean charret has experience and he can say all of these things and talk about these deals likely likely to an extent that pierre polyevre maybe can't uh pierre polyevre mm-hmm. does do a lot of sloganing he's very um eloquent and 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 presentable but he may not have that sort of depth of knowledge but I, I just want to sort of juxtapose, and we're going to wrap up. We've been going for hours. We'll wrap up soon here. But I do want to juxtapose. Um, we can we can set Mr. Aegis in the side because he didn't even show up for this, even though he was right there. Roman Babber's answers were stone cold, principled, unapologetic, direct, and apolitical. They're more in line with with. Pierre Polyevre, not that he's always like that, but the direction that the conservative movement needs to go to defeat Justin Trudeau. Jean Chrétien, there are a lot of political answers. In fact, the only time he's really, really biting, and you'll probably notice this in French as well, is when he's saying that he's going to win, that's the only option. If he's not talking about himself winning, there is quite a bit of sort of political talk going on. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So... Uh, I agree with you. Uh, Mr. Charest have a lot of experience. We can see it is really dominant. I don't know if you saw it. It was like one last question. Thank you. Bye. He, he lead the place. He take his stand, and he's just like he know what he's doing. So of course, for uh, leading for uh, leadership, this is really good because that show that he is strong. Is dominant and he know what he's doing um but i would say to you what do you think about the fact that he say that mr poliev uh if he's elected that show that it will be uh he will lose and if he is he will win the majority you know i think he's attempting to appeal to this rational conservative sentiment that very often sort of comes back you saw it in alberta when the wild rose were sort of poised to take over and conservatives sort of rationally backpedaled didn't vote for daniel smith didn't vote for wild rose we can blame daniel smith all we want but the fact is people didn't vote for her and then there was this whole faltered attempt at reunification. I think Jean Charest is appealing to that non-emotional, non-liberal vote that's saying, well, I might like Pierre Polyever, but the polling tells me that Jean Charest is more likely to win among non-conservatives. I think the question we have to ask ourselves then is, are we going to take the principled person that we are more in line with, or are we going to look at one poll, which we know how Un, sort of sustainable and un, unpredictable polls are. Are we going to shift our voting strategy to to go to this alternative? I could see a lot of people potentially, as this is a preferential ballot, actually shifting, despite the fact that they're they're far more in agreement with with Roman uh, Baber or Dr. Leslie Lewis. I could see them saying, "Well, I agree with that sentiment," and that could move him a little bit up on the ballot, even if they don't agree with him rationally. Jean Charest clearly has a somewhat informed, at the very least, campaign team. He has some political experience, so I think he knows. Well, in a toe to toe, I'm probably not going to beat this guy. Which begs the question: Why didn't Pierre show up tonight? Um, so he's not here. I'll take a few shots at him, and then I'm just going to keep reminding people that, according to the polls, right now I'm the best guy across Canada to get us a majority. So I think that's why he keeps getting back to that time and time again. Final thought, we're going to wrap up soon here. People have been watching for hours. I greatly appreciate everyone tuning in. But what's your sort of final thought on this final leadership debate for the Conservative Party of Canada? I think it was interesting. Uh, The only thing is like we can see that it was mostly media. Uh, I don't think he had like any people in the the place. So I... My only thought is probably why um, Leslie and maybe Pierre Poliev didn't show up uh, for uh, that leadership debate. Um, it w- the question was really interesting, and I think the moderator was good, uh, the one who were dealing with uh, all the questions. And um, 
yeah, I was really surprised of the performance of all the con- candidates, especially in French. They were pretty good because I listened mm-hmm. uh, into French and not uh, translating. And um, I think the only thing I would just remember, like, we talk about the division of the party. I didn't see Barber uh, bashing on any other candidate, either not much each instant. But I saw Sharek always coming back to trying to pull the head of Pierre Poliev, not only for the respect, but as well the fact that he didn't show up. So if you did it, if you prone, if you like promoting to not, divide the party why are you still doing that today yeah 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 no i i, I think that is we saw similar things with uh, raja and sunny here with the provincial leadership race where she was attacking daniel smith and then saying we need unity and people are saying you're, you're attacking people while promoting unity i think that's a really good observation um i i did want to say that overall definitely compared to that tom clark a uh, goofy debate that, that <laughs> this moderator made fun of extensively. I want social clips of all that, those efforts to make fun of that debate. This was a more serious debate. It was far from perfect. The room was weird. Some of the camera angles were weird. There was no audience. That was bizarre. But the actual content, the questions were somewhat substantial. It was it was sort of a fresh shift away from that. Um, I want to encourage, though, for, for any of these leadership Uh, candidates. In fact, I want to challenge you. I've had a chance to speak with some of you, whether you're in Quebec, whether you're in Alberta, French, English, whatever you want. Um, Join us for an extensive interview, not just a four-minute soundbite, but a 15, 20-minute conversation. Some of these candidates have done that, but I'd love to go for a stroll with you, ask you some really tough questions. There's still time for people to make up their minds, change their minds. Uh, Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate to reach out. Send me an email. Reach out to Rebel. We'd love to have those conversations. As always, I am encouraging folks at home to check in regularly and consider supporting this work at leadershipreports.ca. And before we wrap, I want to go through some of these hyper chats um really quickly we'll work through these uh kind of react to them and then we'll call it a night and thank everyone so much for tuning in so first i have uh juta bursi excuse the pronunciation if that's wrong donates one dollar and says i voted and it won't be share uh (laughs) amp60 donates one dollar and says i'm tired i meant less than two i didn't mean to put roman twice i think pierre uh has more chance against trudeau definitely pierre uh Despite those polls, his sort of viral campaign content um, and his sort of his branding and his imaging is definitely mm-hmm. substantial. And and there's also the, the massive rallies that he's been hosting, uh, pretty significant. Um, AMT60 also donates a dollar and says, I missed the first uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, they say that they're only voting for three candidates, Roman, Pierre, uh, and Roman, oh, sorry, this, I think this is where they might've been following up yeah. Roman, Pierre and Leslin uh, out of order, but not sure in what order Roman, my preference, but Pierre has more charisma. Yeah. That I think for many people, and I'm probably, I'm probably getting, you've, you've said the same things on a few of these freedom issues. Roman Babber is the strongest candidate that clip during the scrum when he says, I'm the choice candidate mm-hmm. uh, that is likely to win some people over. Cause he, he was very strong and unapologetic. Is that the sentiment you're getting on that too? I really like what Roman is saying. I really like how he's speaking, his authenticity. Uh, But I would say for Pierre Poliev, he played, or he probably is, authenticity. Being like, showing that he is is representing as mid-wage salary, as lower wage salary than... Like, he is representing all kind of Canadian. And when we look at him, he's dressed like a normal person. And he's doing his grocery as a normal person. It's just showing that authenticity. And yeah. Roman Barber is showing sincerity. So it's really difficult. Yeah, yeah. Adam Ottawa, great to hear from you often uh, chatting in on the live streams. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed this debate. It showed some sincere sides of these candidates. Uh, that intimate sort of connection, I'd agree with you, that you you did get some of that sort of authenticity and conversational yeah. nature. Um, I really think that Roman would make a great senior minister in the next government. Chavez is a socialist with health. 
Um, and then Adam Otto <laughs> gives another dollar and says Charest was almost using bully tactics against the two minor opponents. Lots of chest thumping. It concerns me that he didn't answer the question about whether he loses the race. Yeah, that was just about as political an answer. I'm focused on one thing, but seriously, are you going to stay around? They asked him in French and he's not willing to answer that. I think for most people translated as no, I'm out of here if I don't win. Um, but we shall see, um, uh, some, some effective politically experienced question dodging there. I want to thank you, Alexa Lavois. This was a long stream. It was, it was fun though. From the get go, yeah. we said, we're going to have fun. You did a really great job. Thanks for bringing your sort of French understanding to the conversation as well. I think it's important that maybe the translators mischaracterize it or there something isn't quite properly translated to have that vigilant eye. So we're very grateful. So thank you so much for being here for everyone in the studio, staying up late. I want to thank them so much for the incredible work that they're doing to make this possible. And for everyone at home, absolutely. Thank you so much for tuning in as always for rebel news. I'm Adam. So thanks so much. Have a great night. Have a great night, everybody. So I absolutely love having the opportunity to chat with you, to chat with our ever-growing audience. But I'd actually love for you to have that opportunity as well. We actually have advertising opportunities available with rebelnews.com. We don't get handouts from the government. We